Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Budget Committee meeting for, um, I think it's Wednesday, February 8th, 2023. Uh, my name is Paul Russell. I represent Lower Sackville. It is 9.33 in the morning, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that the Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, uh, the ancestral and unceded lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the Peace and Friendship Treaty signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes, and we have a good amount of them today, uh, January 18 and 20 and 25. Thank you, Councillor Hensby, seconded by Councillor Stoddard. Thank you very much. Are there any errors or omissions? Not seeing any, all in favor of the minutes of January 18, 2025, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Great. Thank you very much. The next item is the approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. Can I have someone to move that? Um, uh, there, there is going to be a change. Um, might as well introduce that at the beginning. And that is we will be, we need to defer the human resources budget until Friday. So can I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended, please? Thank you, Councillor Blackburn, uh, seconded by Councillor Outhit. Are there any other changes from the committee? Not seeing any, all in favor of the agenda as presented and amended, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Great, thank you. Call for declaration of conflict of interest. Seeing none, thank you. The next item on the list is public participation and we begin every budget meeting this way. This is the opportunity for members of the public to come forward and uh, address the Budget Committee, uh, Regional Council, in a different format um, every time we start one of the meetings. So uh, you have your say uh, and, and you can provide uh, whatever input you would like um, on topic uh, and for five minutes. Um, so we do have a speakers list uh, and I'm going to run through the, the one name on that list and then afterwards uh, I'm going to call three times to see if there's anybody else in the gallery who would like to come forward and, and uh, address the budget committee. So the, the name that's on the list is Thomas Arneson McNeil. Thomas, are you here this morning? Please come forward to the mic in the centre. Yes, thank you. And good morning. You have five minutes. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Thomas Arneson McNeil. I'm an energy coordinator with the Ecology Action Center. Uh, my work focuses primarily on policy advocacy and support of vehicle electrification in Nova Scotia with respect to light duty vehicles as well as electric school buses. I would like to thank the Budget Committee for affording me an opportunity to present uh, and recommend that the Committee direct the Chief Administrative Officer to incorporate the Property, Fleet and Environment proposed 2023-2024 budget and business plan into the draft 2023-2024 operating budget. I would like to start by commending staff on the accolades that they have received. Um, uh, on the accolades that they have received for their work on Halifax, including Clean 50's top project of the year in 2023, and Environment, uh, Energy and Environment Director Shannon Miedema in particular for receipt of the Clean 16 Award, recognizing her as an exceptional contributor um, uh, to the clean economy and top contributor in the category of cities nationwide. <laughs> and awarding Halifax top project of the year. Clean 50 also recognized the role the council has played in providing funding through the climate action tax, allowing the HRM to move faster, further, using a collective impact approach. Council should take immense pride in providing the resources needed to fund the major initi initiatives for which the municipality is receiving such widespread attention. It is not enough to simply set climate targets and hope for the best. As policymakers, you have been tasked with fulfilling and actualizing the will of the public. As Nova Scotians continue to experience firsthand the impacts of climate change, including a winter that is set to break records for the least amount of snowfall in the history of Halifax, <coughs> 
numerous power outages related to extreme weather, and an ocean surrounding Atlantic Canada that has been about three to five degrees warmer than usual, we must reflect upon the fact that a supermajority of Nova Scotians, 85%, say that they are concerned about climate change. As the HRM continues its groundbreaking allocation of capital funds uh, to resource comprehensive climate action, Council must remain steadfast in their commitment to providing the resources needed to deploy municipal um, deep energy retrofits, implement the HRM's electric vehicle strategy, electrify our transit fleet, and invest in the critical infrastructure needed to uh, ensure that we are adapting to the impacts of climate change. With the public behind you and some well-deserved recognition of Halifax, uh, the hard work of implementing the many policy changes needed to achieve our municipal climate goals begins in 2023. Uh, throughout this process, the HRM's commitment to leading by example stands out in contrast to the barriers that we face. The target of net zero municipal operations by the year 2030, including the decarbonization of the HRM's light duty cor corporate fleet, represents a willingness on the part of municipal staff and policymakers to demonstrate the benefits of transportation electrification. However, we must recognize, uh, as both Mayor Savage and city staff have, uh, that wide scale vehicle electrification will not occur unless policymakers at other levels of government lower wait times through the implementation of a zero emissions vehicle mandate. Ensuring adequate electric vehicle supply through regulation in Nova Scotia is the responsibility that rests with the Government of Canada. Uh, and provincial targets are badly needed in the context of Canada's proposed national ZEV standard. Uh, these supply shortages may lead to difficulties in procuring EVs for the corporate fleet uh, and a lack of market uncertainty in relation to utility charging infrastructure deployment will persist unless this problem is addressed. Uh, in moving forward with these investments, staff should also consider other ways to further the goals of electromobility. Uh, for example, five municipalities in New Brunswick have purchased electric vehicles through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, Municipalities for Climate Innovation Program. Uh, when not used by municipal staff, these vehicles are made available to members of the community through an online booking system as part of the SOVI program. Innovative solutions such as this can help ensure more equitable access to electric vehicles and eliminate the need for vehicle ownership. Uh, municipal building retrofits, which will represent the majority of capital budget expenditure for Halifax from 2023 uh, to 2027, are another exciting area uh, with a significant potential for decarbonization. Ensuring these projects are adequately staffed and resourced will be of paramount importance. Broad-based support and workforce capacity building will be necessary to ensure that the HRM is meeting our goals and that others can follow our example that the municipality is setting. Uh, Halifax climate modeling to achieve net zero by 2050 calls for 5,000 deep energy building retrofits each year on average and facilitating the workforce capacity and barrier reduction needed to further this goal will require creative solutions. I'll, uh, I'll end Thomas, my comments there. You, you are five minutes. I'm going yeah. to ask you to come to a close soon. Please. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I would like to conclude just by saying that as you incorporate the proposed budget and business plan into the draft operating budget, uh, know that the public and the next generation of climate leaders stands firmly behind you and look to your example in pursuit of a more just and sustainable future in Nova Scotia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for uh, coming to the Budget Committee this morning. Are there any other speakers in the gallery? Please step forward. And although we all know you, please introduce yourself. And, and then you Good morning, Colin May, a resident of Dartmouth. I was up late last night doing one of these again. Uh, the HRM, the sheet is about the HRM pension plan costs. On the left hand side is the cost by budget year and the item special payments with interest is by the calendar year. Uh, you can see how the special payments varied all the way up to $23 million and totaled over 13 years, they totaled 238 million, half of which was paid by the taxpayer and the other half was paid by the employees. Down the bottom you can see how the contribution rate in 2004 was 8.56% on the main division, which is non-police, non-fire, non-emergency services. And then in, it worked its way up until January 2016 when it became 12.21. 
Now the special payments, according to the latest actuarial report last year, would be in this calendar year, the grand sum of $240,000, which as you can see is down from 16.4 million. So my question is quite simple, is how is this reduction shown in the budget and how much, what percentage reduction would it be shown in the budget? As recognizing at the same time that people have had wage increases and therefore the contributions would go up. But I think when I did these numbers, I was like, the conclusion I reached was finally, the special payments are coming to an end. And I'd conclude by saying that when you look across the pension plans in the municipal sector across country, in fact, even if you get into the private sector, you'll find something that I've said for many years, which is the HRM pension plan is the most generous in the country and the most expensive, on top of primarily because it's stacked with CPP, whereas everybody else, it's integrated with CPP. So you've got a better, the employees and the council members got a better pension plan than even MPs. So I, I just conclude in saying, if Mr. Chairman, to your left and to your right are two senior members of the pension plan, perhaps they could explain how this is good news and how it is going to impact the budget because it's not listed as a line item. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Colin. Um, why don't you and I get together at some point a little bit later? And, uh, and let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. Okay. Thank you very much. We do have a question from the mayor, Colin. If, if you wouldn't mind having a seat for just a minute, we do have a question from the mayor. Go ahead, Mr. Yeah, mayor. Not really a question for Colin. Thank you, Colin, for the, the information. I, I'm just wondering, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this here, but I'm wondering if we could ask Jerry just to do up an information report for us uh, based on this and the impacts on the budget. Um, I'd like a little bit uh, point of view from our staff on this. Is that something we could do, Jerry, without a motion? Or it doesn't have to come back for discussion, but I'd like to just to sort of get an analysis of it uh, at some point in time. Yeah. Just, uh, <clears throat> just in context to what Mr. May yeah, submitted? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much. I, I don't see any further speakers on the list. So for the second time, are there any further speakers in the gallery who would like to step forward and address the Budget Committee? And for the third and final time, are there any speakers in the gallery who would like to address the Budget Committee? Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Now, uh, around the table, we have been building a budget adjustment list, and an update to that was sent out, and they will be sent out regularly. Uh, so that should be in your email from, I think, last night. Uh, Jerry, wouldn't, would you mind speaking to some of the items on that list, please? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Jerry Blackwood, CFO. Um, <clears throat> as per past years, uh, we'll continue to update council for each, or budget committee for each, uh, each session, just to kind of give uh, a little bit of a line of sight of where we stand. So just a couple of things I just want to uh, draw your attention to. Um, first of all, um, there's, a, there's quite a few things that have been added to the bow. We don't have costs it yet. They, they take a little bit more, uh, more time as opposed to like you look at, uh, you know, public safety strategy, for example, we had that cost hit up front. Uh, some of the things uh, from the uh, HRP uh, budget debate is going to take a little bit more time as well as the capital items um, uh, from the capital uh, budget debate. <clears throat> Um, the overall um, uh, change to the rate right now is we're sitting at about 1.6%. Okay, so just want to bring council back. Yes, for staff to kind of come in with options for four. You're at 6.1. There's quite a few bowel items that have been added that are going to be additional costs that haven't been costed. But to get from, you know, 
6.1 to 4, you're looking at about another $12 million of reductions, right? So just be mindful, $6 million is 1% on the tax increase. So I just wanted to point out that to you because it seems we're kind of going the other way, uh, moving away from 4% as opposed to getting closer to 4%. So we'll continue to provide uh, that update and, and certainly uh, when you receive it, if you have any, any questions, uh, you can certainly reach out uh, to me or, or bring it up at Budget Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Purdy. Thank you. Thank you. I just had a question about one of the capital items, the library in um, Councillor Outfit's district. Sorry, not the library, the fire station. I'm wondering, because I think the original ask is, is a big, big item, ticket item with the training center attached. Are we, are we going to have two options for funding that, like to do a smaller fire station first and then a training center later? Or, ha or is that just going to be the one big... Um, briefing note for, for the original. Oh. <laughs> we have a guest. <laughs> uh, I was just <laughs> wondering what that would encapsulate. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Um, I think probably I would hold that question for John McPherson. McPherson when he presents later this afternoon. Okay. That briefing note will be coming from uh, from his business unit, and I know he and I had a, had a couple of conversations about it. Okay. Um, that was shortly after uh, it was put to the ballot. But uh, you can certainly ask, you know, okay. what what they're looking at there in terms of uh, options. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Purdy. Let's move ahead now with the uh, IT presentation, um, and I'd like to welcome David Thorpe and, and a number of other people, one of which I worked with in a previous life. Welcome, David. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the Budget Committee. Uh, my name is David Thorpe and I'm the Executive Director of IT and the Chief Information Officer. Uh, seated beside me is Heather Caldwell, who's the Coordinator for IT, and she'll be running the presentation for us this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today as we seek approval of the IT budget for 2023-24. So our mission in IT is to deliver technology and solutions that enable the Halifax Regional Municipality to become an organization that governs with transparency and evidence-based decision making while providing secure, customer-centric digital services that align with council and administrative priorities. Uh, so within IT, we have six core service areas. The architecture and infrastructure group is led by Daryl Hiltz. So this group maintains the infrastructure and designs the technology solutions which support HRM's operations. The architecture part of the group is focused on evaluating business problems and opportunities and designing software solutions to address these needs. The infrastructure part of the group is responsible for implementing and maintaining the physical devices which run and provide access to the technology solutions upon which HRM depends. Both groups continually strive to provide robust and cost-effective solutions. Our cybersecurity team is led by Bruce Rosen. So this team manages our information security program using risk management methodologies, security controls, and proactive monitoring and reporting. Uh, their approach is captured in the cybersecurity framework, which outlines the practices that they follow. So this group continually endeavors to strike that delicate balance between protecting the organization, but still enabling its productivity. Our data analytics and visualization team is led by Paul Schaffelberg. So this service area comprises all the disciplines related to managing spatial and non-spatial data as an asset on behalf of municipal business units. They focus on solutions to maintain collections of data and develop insights from our data, which business units and residents can leverage for data-driven decision-making. Housed within this group as well are our web analysts who maintain our web-based systems that support Halifax.ca and our internal internet sites. Our Enterprise Resource Planning, Delivery Management and Operations Group is led by George Heyman. Uh, last year, you would have seen us refer to this group as the Business Foundations Program, which was at the time focused on delivering solutions on the SAP platform. 
The responsibilities of this group has grown to encompass other areas of enterprise resource planning, other than those just supported through SAP, such as corporate scheduling. So this department is responsible for the implementation, management, and enhancement of the systems which support our financial, human resources, and corporate scheduling business functions. Our service management and operations group is led by Corinne McCormick. So this customer service and continuous improvement focused service area is responsible for the ongoing execution, maintenance, and support of our business applications and devices used throughout the municipality. This includes the provisioning of devices, application administration, service desk, and extensive contract management services. Our strategic planning and delivery group is led by Martha Wilson. So this group plans and executes the portfolio of projects that enable business units to leverage technology. Business relationship managers within the team are assigned to each business unit to provide advice on leveraging technology and to assist them, assist them in leveraging the services that IT provides. Business analysts, project managers, and chain managers plan, lead, and together execute projects working with internal business and technology resources as well as external vendors when required. So highlights of some of our successes from the past year. As I mentioned, we've introduced the business relationship management function, assigning a relationship manager to each business unit to assist them in leveraging technology. We've inaugurated the IT Investment Committee to drive business-driven focused decisions regarding the initiatives that IT will undertake. Working in tandem with HRM business units, the Project Management Office has delivered several initiatives, including Corporate Performance Dashboard, providing strategic and corporate KPIs, HRP e-disclosure to manage evidence in electronic format, HRP scan to file, facilitating digitizing reports and documents, Cogswell Project App to provide residents with road closure information, uh, HRFE Automatic Vehicle Locator Solution, giving response time information, and with PPLNC, we implemented the planning module within the POSSE system. Related to cybersecurity, we introduced cybersecurity awareness training across the organization to educate employees on safe practices. Uh, they've also implemented, implemented multi-factor authentication, providing enhanced security when granting access to municipal technology assets. As a leadership team, we developed an IT strategic plan to guide the activities of the IT team, and we've been executing on its actions. Uh, several initiatives uh, from our data analytics and visualization group. Uh, the first, they actually received a reward where they were ranked number one in what's called the Geospatial Maturity Index, which is an award given by an organization called PSD Citywide. So we're very proud of that. Uh, we provided mapping support to the district boundary review, developed the candidate sidewalk priority rating tool the Public Works, collaborated with HRFE to develop a new fire inspection solution, provided HRP updated data terminal maps with current imagery to aid in public safety, along with the finance business unit, launched the capital budgeting tools and reporting. Uh, an HRFE microsite was created, providing information to volunteer and career firefighters. Uh, we provide further enhancements to the tax certificate request service, along with the revenue team, enabling residents to make online requests that are tied to the new tax and revenue management system we put in place. We released 23 new data sets into open data and launched a number of dashboards, including ones for facilities management, HRFE fire prevention, HRFE performance, IT desk ticket analysis, park assets for the planning and development system, and to manage our open data sets. Uh, two key accomplishments for our enterprise resource planning group. So working with HR, we implemented the success factors employee central module across the organization, and in tandem with the revenue team, launched a new tax and revenue management system, which is part of SAP's new S4 HANA platform. Uh, so for planned initiatives, uh, so our administrative priority is our IT strategy. So last year we developed our strategy to guide all the activities of all the groups within IT. So our goals are to augment and improve upon the capabilities of the IT group to better support HRM business units. Some key areas from this strategy are a strong focus on employee engagement and development, reviewing many of our processes and procedures and to make improvements, performing initiatives that will facilitate productivity improvements for HRM employees, and working to increase our relationships with business units, increasing our understanding of their strategies and priorities, and proactively assisting them in meeting their mandates. 
A significant piece of our strategy is the establishment of an IT investment committee. So we fully recognize that the initiatives that IT undertakes need to be governed by the needs and opportunities of the business function, not driven by technology-based decisions. So the IT investment committee will provide business decision making and prioritization that will determine the projects that IT delivers. So this year we inaugurated this committee consisting of the two deputy CAOs, the chief financial officer and the chief information officer. Next year we will operationalize the actions of this committee and leverage them to evaluate, approve and prioritize all new initiatives. Uh, so this year we work with the Halifax team to lay the groundwork for managing various sets of data to assist in decision making and providing information reporting. In the case of the flood water and lake watchers data sets, we have added them into HRM's data stores, made the data available to internal staff, and released them through our open data for public consumption. Work is underway to do the same with the HRM natural asset inventory as well. Uh, we're developing a pilot uh, for a Halifax Climate Action Hub, which will provide information for internal purposes and to inform HRM residents of Halifax initiatives. In tandem with the emergency management and the Halifax team, IT is providing HRM data sets for the hazard risk and vulnerability analysis that's being performed and will integrate the outputs of this work into other HRM decision making tools. Uh, looking at some of our key performance metrics. Uh, our first is our core network availability, which was at 99.99%. Uh, so this value represents the uptime that our municipal's core network has had in our data centers. So at 99.99%, that means that basically we've had less than 53 minutes of downtime during the year. Uh, so for spam e emails that are diverted from users, uh, we're averaging about 1.3 million of those per month. So our spam filters prevent employees from ever seeing what can be potentially malicious emails. So at that rate, that represents almost 95% of the emails that we actually receive. Uh, our cybersecurity awareness training that launched this week, we have a completion rate nearing 75% across the organization. And then uh, our last one here is our cybersecurity incidents requiring intervention. Uh, so our monitoring software will actually detect uh, issues as they come and it can address some of them themselves. But in some instances, they do require intervention from our cybersecurity team if they're of a severe enough uh, level. So these are things like somebody clicking a malicious link in an email, accessing a website uh, that could be malicious, or downloading a piece of malware. So our, our the actions we would take in those cases are range from contacting the employee to provide further education through to actually isolating their their laptop off of our network and having to cleanse it before we're allowing it back on. So we're now up to 208 uh, open data sets available, which is an increase of 23 from last year. So this is an area we continue to see growth and we'll expect to add 20 to 30 per year. Uh, our website, halifax.ca, saw 6.18 million visits over the last year. And our IT service desk uh, receives 35,000 inbound contacts for assistance. So that includes telephone calls, emails, and tickets that are put into our self-service portal, which is a slight increase from last year of about 4,000. And in total for personal devices that uh, employees have that we maintain, there's around 4,500 of those. So that includes laptops and desktop computers, tablets, and cell phones. Uh, so changes to our FTEs, so we have two new positions that, that appear in our account this year and those are both part of the Bridging the Gap program and, and funded through there. So these are 18 month long temporary positions. So our first is a business analyst intern working with our portfolio and project management office. And the second is a ServiceNow application developer intern working with our business applications team. ServiceNow is the name of our internal ticketing system and that's what they'll be working on. Uh, we also removed 18 temporary capital funded positions uh, for next year. Now these are positions that were not occupied and were not part of our wage model. Uh, they've been used to support projects uh, over the past few years, uh, which we won't be using in the future. Uh, so overall those didn't actually have any financial impact to our, to our budget. And looking at changes in our financials, so we had an increase this year of $201,700 for salaries and overtime. Uh, we've had a sizable increase to our vacancy management target of $678,450. Uh, 
Uh, we decreased uh, our plans for using external contractors by $105,000. Uh, with the addition of our new tax and revenue management system, uh, they have a support contract there for $600,700. We had an increase in our Microsoft licensing of $300,300. Uh, we will be having new support agreements for core network infrastructure of $201,300. So as we are adding and replacing new pieces within our data center, those will come with their own new service contracts, which is accounted for there. Uh, we had an increase in other contracts and licensing of $655,700. And those are spread across a variety of systems and are a combination of inflationary increases that you would expect, but also increased usage throughout the organization driving further licensing. And then some miscellaneous adjustments of 173,150, the bulk of which falls into the categories of hardware devices that are being supported and increases in usage in our cell phones within the organization. So overall, our budget, like all, T, all IT department budgets, can be really thought of in two main categories. So there's the money that's required for running the department, which is really just our salaries and office expenses, and that accounts for around $14 million of our $32.7 million budget. But then the, the bigger part is the money that's tied directly to the services that are required by the rest of the organization. So these are things such as the support and execution of our systems and infrastructure, and provisioning and maintaining hardware and devices for employees. So that's approximately 18.7 million of our total budget, and that is the area where we see the bulk of increases year over year. Uh, so those are driven by, again, inflationary pressures on service contracts, uh, inflationary pressures on hardware prices and items like that. So overall, you see we have a net increase of 1.35 million or 4.3% over last year. So 1.8 million of that total increase is our cost for licensing and supporting of various systems with a further $201,000 of salary increases. And this is being offset by reducing some of our contracting budget and a sizable growth in our vacancy target. And I'd be happy to, oh, happy to address any questions from there. Thank you very much, David. Um, Mayor Savage, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I'll put the motion on the uh, floor that the Budget Committee, one, direct the CAO to incorporate the IT proposed 23-24 budget and business plan as set out and discussed in the accompanying plan and supporting presentation into the draft 23-24 operating budget. Is that it? Good. Um, David, thank, thank you for this. Just a couple of questions that I, uh, I have. The, the first one, can you just explain again the 16 positions that um, are not, no longer required but don't have any budget impact? Can you just explain that to me a bit? Sure. Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, to the Mayor. Yes, yeah, so these were positions that sat not in our wage model but sat in our org chart. They were funded ca through capital for individual projects, so the projects were paying for them. Uh, we're not going to be needing those moving forward, so just for cleanliness, we removed them from our, our overall staff count. But they were funded somewhere else? They were funded capital. by capital projects previously. Okay. okay. But not part of our wage model. And does the capital budget, did that show that? that uh... So those particular projects would have had that. So this is in the past that they've been used. We haven't been using them for the last little while. Right. Um, the other question I have is on cybersecurity. I just um, want a bit of an update on that. Um, you know, there's a couple of companies in our uh, city over the last couple of years that have had some unbelievable cybersecurity issues that have led to incredible costs and disruption of uh, business. So two questions. How prepared do we think we are, knowing that we don't know what we don't know? But also, are other governments, are other governments, particularly municipal, being affected uh, by cybersecurity uh, catastrophes? Okay. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, through the Mayor. So to answer your second part first, uh, yes, I think all municipalities, no different than any other organization, are uh, equally threatened um, um, by, by these things. We have seen municipalities who have had ransomware attacks occur to them in the past, so uh, definitely that is something that we're aware of and, and always concerned about. Um, so the first part of your question, 
uh, again, we, we are prepared as well as we're prepared. I guess this is always the always answer you get to a question like that. Uh, we do very typical things on the technology side. Um, we've invested well in those pieces. We have good practices as far as keeping our systems up to date. Uh, we introduced the cybersecurity training this year because uh, you know, issues with employees making mistakes is, is a very common attack vector uh, that we're always very concerned about. So. At the same time, uh, no one would tell you, you know, we're completely safe uh, because the threats keep increasing and the intelligence of the attackers keep increasing, so it's an area where we're continuing to apply diligence. So are there Canadian cities that have had cybersecurity major uh, disruptions? Uh, yeah, I can't quote you any right now, but yes, I believe there have been some municipalities okay. who have had particularly ransomware attacks. Okay, so the only other things I would have is, uh, um, we seem to have a very aggressive firewall. I think it came in yesterday when we were trying to get a petition through here. <laughs> like, a lot of stuff gets caught up. Now, we're able to go in and, and activate it on our, our websites, but uh, we have a lot of, <laughs> and I guess maybe that ties into things like cybersecurity and phishing. And can you stop getting, I'm sending these people all kinds of notes that I have nothing to do with, looking for, <laughs> looking for meetings next week, looking for personal donations to the family fund and everything. How many <laughs> so, gift cards can one God. man buy? <laughs> It's, um, anyway, I, I will accept any gift cards, you, but just drop them at the office. Don't send them through the uh, email. Anyway, listen, I, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, a bit of a pain, uh, but uh, that's part of the way we do business these days, right? So, yeah. Well, that's if, how you tell them not mine, they're poorly written. Thank you very much, David. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I can address that very last point of yours about uh, you, you sort of sending emails to everybody else, that, that relates to uh, the users on the other end having the education and the experience to recognize that that is potentially spam, that that is potentially a phishing email or malware or something. And so I would remind all of council uh, and all of the other employees uh, with HRM, if there is uh, security training available, please take it. Um, it is worth its weight in gold. Yeah, just the last thing I want to say is that I got to give Councillor Hensby credit. He's always the first one to send a note back saying, this isn't you, is it? So uh, <laughs> he must be on top of his emails. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. David, thanks for the presentation. You know, it's interesting. IT is, is like a referee in hockey. If you don't remember the referee, uh, we, it was a good game. And as long as things are working, we don't even think about you guys, right? And, but I appreciate the work you and your team uh, do. My question was the same as the mayor's. It was around uh, cyber attacks. And I'm wondering, I know you can't go into details here, because, uh, but I'm wondering if at some point in time we can get a, a briefing on what you're doing and how close we, did we come. And I'm sure we've come close many times. And the mayor alluded to, we've had some very big private uh, businesses that had in our city had significant damage done to their operation, and not to mention healthcare is always a big uh, target. So I'm wondering at some point in time we could get maybe a little more information that you can't share with us in public just to see how close we are. Um, the one question I do have uh, uh, is around the website visits. You said 6.18 uh, million website visits. Is that up or down from last year? Do you, do you know that offhand? Oh, um, okay. and, I think it's and if you don't know that right away, that's last okay. Year? Uh, what I'm getting to, David, if you don't know that right away, that's okay. I, I'm just trying to, now how do we measure that our website is effective, right? Uh, you know, uh, we did have some changes to the website over the years, but uh, is it effective? Uh, it can be more effective, uh, and we drive, we direct our residents to that website as much as possible. So uh, I don't know, and, and I don't know if that falls under your responsibility, but how do we know that we're doing the best we possibly can when it comes to our website? Because it's, a, it's an important tool for us for communication. Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, uh, to the Councillor, uh, it's a very good question. So it was actually 5.2 million okay. uh, last year, so it is up a little bit. And again, this metric is a little more of a technology metric. So right. how we measure effectiveness, we, we use an analytics, pack, analytics package, which right. measures activity on the website and 
you know, hundreds of different data points. So we're speaking here to just how many visits happen to the site. So as a technology group, right. uh, we're not focused on the content of the site, right. we're focused on running the system. So, so making sure that for the volume of activity it's getting, we're maintaining a site that can stay up and running and performing right. well. Uh, so, so I think when uh, some other folks come to present their budgets, they're gonna have some metrics around the number of individual users okay. uh, who came to the site. So those will be groups that'll be a little more focused on the actual contents of the site and driving the good behaviors uh, to attract people to it. Okay, uh, thank you, David and uh, colleagues. You know, uh, be respectful to IT because they can make your life miserable, right? So uh, I appreciate it, David, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Mancini. Go ahead, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, David, and team for all the work that you do supporting us in IT. So a few, a few questions, and one, I first must apologize because with the, 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 the emails that we get from the mayor, I, I some, most times, all the time, I respond to them and <laughs> keep them going uh, just for, for fun. Uh, usually I ask them if they want Cortland or Macintosh and they, they tell me um, words. Uh, I won't say what those words are, so obviously they don't like that I play along with them. Uh, what I will say is, is, and this always has been a quirk of mine, and folks will remember, I always complained about the search function on the website. Like I, that to me was the, 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 the biggest problem that I had was how to search things on website. And I know over years that's been improved. And, and, I, and I will say someone who uses that a lot, it's a lot better than what it was. So I just want to commemorate the, the team for, for hearing those complaints and, and working on that. Uh, I do wonder about the, the budget aspect. So when I look at the budget uh, page three, where it has a breakdown, um, there's three, three areas that I just want a little bit more understanding on. One is the service management and operations. Uh, one and the other is, is office and external services. So the office and external services so I'm looking at the 22-23 budget, or sorry, 23-24, uh, and, or, yeah, 23-24, and the office budget seems to be down uh, a few million, so I'm just wondering if there's been a change uh, there, or actually, no, I think I'm reading that wrong. No, uh, 600,000. Anyway, just wondering, are we still using majority of rented space? Are we, are we starting to, to shift? Um, also external services, can you just talk a little bit about what are some of those external services that we're using? Because that, that equates to a few million dollars as well. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, through the councilor. Again, so, so office, th that isn't actually office rental costs. Uh, those are mainly service contracts for, for internal use. So, so the office is, say that one more time. Oh, sorry. Sorry, we have a little breakdown, just one oh, sec. Okay, sure. So sorry, I don't have the detailed breakdown with me here today, uh, but I will get that sent to you. Yeah, that'd be great, because that's a, that's a pretty big chunk of your, your budget just to get a better understanding of what, what happens there. And then also external services, what that, what that is as well. Thank you. Uh, so it's through you again uh, to the counselor. Yeah, so, so again, it's a little bit misleading. Um, those will be a lot of technology service contracts that are fall under that category, not what you typically think of as office rental space or anything right. like that. But We'll okay. get you a detailed breakdown. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Smith. Go ahead, Councillor Morse. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a quick question on um, related to vacancy management. And I'm wondering if there are any significant projects you've had to uh, postpone um, because of the inability, inability to hire or because of vacancy management. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, so, I mean, over the last probably two years, uh, it has been a bit of a challenging market to, to hire in. Uh, so, yes, there have been projects in the past that maybe went at a slower pace than we would have originally uh, liked them to. Uh, nothing that we've cancelled or anything like that, nor have we, in order to meet a vacancy target, 
uh, delayed doing any work um, strictly for that purpose. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hensby, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's an annual question I kind of asked in regards to all the licensing and stuff that we have and the service agreements and stuff. Um, I'm always curious of how long of a duration these these uh, licensing agreements are. Uh, are they once a year, multiple years, and also the status of our equipment or, or our software uh, licenses in regards to how current are we or how far behind are we in some of our technology and stuff like I still got an iPhone 7 and everybody else is up to 13 or beyond. But I, anyway, I just kind of curious of where we are technically in regards to our evolution, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, through you. <laughs> I miss my Blackberry too. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, so our service contracts and support contracts, uh, they range. Some of them are yearly. Uh, many of them have three and five year uh, patterns to them. It really depends on what it is and how long we can predict needing the service. Uh, usually there's a longer term will enable us to get a little bit better pricing. So we'll sway towards three to five year contracts if we can, uh, but some are only annual. Uh, as far as keeping things up to date, uh, that is a very important thing. Um, so we do try and stay at whatever the level recommended by a vendor is. Uh, so that we're continually patching, which is important from a cybersecurity point of view, and then staying current with functionality as much as we can. And with all this constant patching or updating and stuff, are we kind of are we kind of locked into the technology we use by the brand we use and stuff? Like I'm just kind of curious, or is, is it all exclusive uh, exclusivity for Apple or for or Microsoft, or depending on what software we're using? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. Um, I guess yes and no. I mean, there's a certain amount when you think of things like our Microsoft licensing, which is one of our significant spends. These are tools that are prevalent throughout the organization. So if we were to ever to consider changing off of those, the impacts would be significant uh, and very costly. So, so for something like that year over year, we don't really take a serious look at, uh, at changing something like that. So we are have some core systems, SAP is another one. That's a, a, our cornerstone financial system. Changing off of that would be very challenging to do, so uh, we have built on it over time. And my last question was going to be about SAP in regards to status of that. How are, it's been evolving over the many years when we first brought it on, and then we talked about maybe we should be providing a service for the whole province for SAP. But I'm kind of curious. We now con, kind of taken that out of our department off to a third party. I think is now doing the, the SAP work. Just want to clarify our relationship there. And I want to know in regards to every time we have to do updating with the SAP system, how is that being charged to bill back to us? Is it a per, per service fee, per request call, or is there a standard a annual uh, maintenance fee? Okay, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, so yes, SAP, we do have hosted by a third party for us, uh, and they provide maintenance. We have an internal team that does some of the maintenance work on it, but we do have external contractors who do the bulk of the work in supporting it. Uh, and those, depending on, it's a, it's a fairly large, complex relationship we have, so there are some flat fee parts to it that are for the hosting pieces. Uh, if we do enhancements, and those are fee per service uh, at our request. Um, so it's a mixture of sort of standard year over year and then some variable to it. And has our cost with ASCP rather consistent year after year or is some years fluctuates high or low in regards to the amount of, of upgrading or, or patchwork or, or system inputting? Yeah, so, so it will, again, through you, Mr. Chair, the Councillor. Uh, so it will vary year over year. And in the last few years, we've actually been adding in new components with it, which, is, which has raised some of our support costs. And how up to date is our SAP system? Uh, so we have uh, a mixture, so we are on the original ECC, uh, so SAP has a newer version of the financial system called S4 HANA, which we're exploring, potentially moving on to at some point, uh, but the ECC system, although not the newest version, is still fully supported and we keep that fully up to date. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Go ahead, Councillor Lovelace. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for this great presentation. I just want to point out how much work your team does. It is incredible. If uh, if we have a cyber attack today, and this municipality uh, could essentially be shut down. So you know, it is extremely important the work that uh, that you and your team do. So thank you so much for that. I am really impressed with the significant increase in open data sets. Um, I, I think over the past couple of years, you know, uh, there has definitely been um, an interest from the public to learn more, to know more, to have access to more information. And the amount of time that it would take for staff to pull that information together just was not efficient and, and certainly was costly. So now we continue to provide more and more information to the public uh, to ensure that they know what's going on, where a street light is, if it's owned by Nova Scotia Power, if it's owned by the municipality. You know, this is vitally important important. Um, so, so good work for that. I think um, looking at the number of, um, you know, calls that we come in as well to our contact center, uh, you know, some of those can be redirected to open data. But I think we need to talk to our corporate comms team about making sure that the community is aware of how to access those open data sets. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, the, the, the website, and I recognize the content is, uh, you know, that's, that's corporate comms folks, uh, but when it comes to some of the tools, whether it's, um, you know, implementing AI or machine learning or, or, or some kind of machine intelligence to have a better search engine tool, tool, for example, and the fact that we have, you know, really old legacy documents that date back, you know, decades, um, whether it's minutes uh, that are, you know, uh, regional council minutes, for example, and there's a project that people are trying to find information about. It is time consuming and frustrating to go through that search engine on that website. So I'm just, my question is, do we have some kind of a, uh, a push to look at using more automated content retrieval system within our website? Is that next generation of the website going to include um, some AI so it's a little bit easier for people to actually pull up that information that they're looking for? And obviously, you know, we've, we've got lots of tools uh, uh, that we can use, whether it's, you know, yesterday, <laughs> I admit, couldn't find my laptop. We all have laptops that look like this. And uh, I think what I'll do is just put a sticker on. It's like, Pam's laptop. Um, <laughs> but seriously, I'm, I'm thinking like geotagging. Why can't I have something on here so I know? I, I know that I can find my phone. I know where my iPhone is. Uh, but just thinking about, uh, you know, those, those tiny little tools that we can use um, just to make things a little bit easier. And also, I, I recognize you have thousands of um, IT devices uh, that, that your team is responsible for. So uh, I just want to give a shout out to the folks who help Help us get into our iPhones when they're locked because we put it or lost. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Tony. Thank you, Mancini. I know you lose yours a lot, don't you? <laughs> Um, but seriously, you know, just just thinking about like that next generation of uh, of, of intelligence and uh, where where we're going to take our IT in the future. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, so I guess currently I would say no, we don't have any plans um, for AI on the website or, or anything like that. Um, that's not to say that's not a direction that we'll eventually move in. Uh, one thing we are working on right now, uh, which we'll start seeing executing in, in the new year, is building a, a governance model for, for Halifax.ca, for the website itself. Uh, so that's been a challenge. I think it's been a little confusing as to who to turn to to, to seek assistance yes. uh, and, and vet ideas through. So we're working on that now with the corporate comms and, and the other stakeholders that are content providers for the mm -hmm. website to define a governance model so it becomes very clear uh, how you can make requests um, for things to be done on the site uh, and, and how we'll sort of grow it moving forward. Well, and I can understand that because it really is an onion, right? There's just layers and layers of content and as things change and technology changes, we just add pieces and modules to it. And then at the end of the day, you're trying to figure out who's responsible for what. And as we change our business units and people move to this uh, unit and that unit, obviously we're in a position to find out, well, who's supposed to be updating this and, and, and so on. And so I love the feature on the website where people can just uh, go in and say, oh, there's a typo here or there's a problem here. So 
so it is very responsive, which is which is great. And I think keeping that content, and we'll talk about uh, content with uh, our comms team, but certainly keeping that content uh, current and re current and relevant, and ensuring that we put as much information that's easily retrieved uh, by the public saves our staff time, and uh, certainly is more efficient for the public as well. So thank you so much to you and your team, David. Thank you very much, Councillor Lovelace. Go ahead, Councillor Purdy. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, David. I want to thank you and your team as well. And just a shout out to Corey and your other staff who I've called on occasion. Oh, <laughs> uh, just how professional and how helpful and how wonderful your team is and just really appreciate that. And just looking through these pages here and how IT really is the backbone of HRM as an organization, you just you have something everywhere. And um, I was just actually wanting to clarify something I heard you say, but I'm not sure if I heard you correctly. On um, one of your slides there, uh, your ninth slide, your service desk inbound contact volume is 35,000 this year. Did I hear you say that's up from about 4,000 last year? And if I heard that correctly, what would you attribute that huge increase to? And also, just um, C34, the recreation software transition project, I see that we've got 2.5 million in the budget for this year, and I think that's the replacement of legend. And I was just wondering, who makes that decision for the Parks and Rec um, Department? Because I was one of the ones transitioning to legend and it was a nightmare and we spent how many millions of dollars on this and now it's not even available anymore so like to avoid that in the future like to, to is feedback going to be taken from people who actually worked with legend and and saw some of the gaps and downfalls of that particular program to help inform what program they go with next and is that 2.5 million subject to change? Like, what if the program's more than that? Or like, how does that work when you're trying to revamp a whole program for a whole organization? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, so on your first point, uh, so yes, it was 35,000 uh, inbound contacts. Uh, I'm sorry if I misspoke. It was that it's up 4,000 from oh, last year, up not 4, up 000. from 4,000. Oh, yeah, okay. so it's not as severe of a change. Um, that makes more sense. In that way. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, and so with the, the REC software, uh, so that is a bit of an unfortunate situation because we do have a, a system um, that we, you know, did a lot of work to roll out throughout the organization. Uh, the company that uh, provided that software was acquired by another company uh, who isn't continuing with the product. So they have another product. Uh, which we've evaluated and is equivalent um, to it, but they're going to cease supporting that product uh, in the not too distant future. So that's what's driving this change. It's, it's not us or any other business unit requesting to swap that out because it has been working quite well uh, once it got launched. So, so the dollars we have in the budget are actually for the, the project management, business analysis, and change management, recognizing that doing a change uh, for these facilities uh, will be challenging. Oh. So they will be working with them to make sure that, that you know, their business processes map well onto the new product and it's as seamless as possible and helping to manage them through the actual change. So this 2.5 million doesn't take into account the new program? That's just the no, transition so, so, period. Yes, so they will be swapping us to this other product. Um, with, so there's no additional charge for the software to us. This is strictly for managing the, the, the project itself, um, working with all the different organizations, doing the requirements gathering, uh, helping the, the company with the design, and then the rollout and the change management pieces. So they will be offering support for the new product? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, David, uh, you also mentioned that the website visits were around four million last year, and that might have gone up to six million, and that might also be where uh, where the numbers got uh, misheard or something. Uh, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, David and team. Um, I. Uh, I go to the HRM website all the time looking for information and 
you know, just you know, point to Councillor Lovelace's comments around kind of the legacy com um, content that's on there. You know, sometimes I'll go and I'll search something, and every time I search, I come to a different page, and I can never get back to the same page. So there's like multiple pages with the same information, um, which is often like a labyrinth to navigate, and um, and you know, the website, you know, is only as good as the content that's on it. And so I'm just wondering about the interface between IT and the different departments, ensuring, like, how do we ensure the content is current and accurate? And for one thing, like, the um, uh, one thing is the, uh, I'm just looking at it now, the planning applications page, which I've had issues in the past. You know, I have my map, I have, like, I can see where information is, I direct my constituents there, I click on a dot, and I get a, sorry, we can't find the page you're looking for. And there's no, they're dead ends. So there's a lot of, so there's a lot of dead ends. But if I happen to land on a different page, I might find that information. But it's just, there's no, I guess, back to the whole question around optimizing the search engine, getting rid of some of the legacy content and duplication, ensuring that IT is connecting in a timely fashion with the other departments to keep the data current. Um, you know, I, I had an issue a while back too around the construction map and learned that, you know, the construction map was great, it was on there, but the content was hit or missed depending on whether the, um, the compliance officer in charge of overseeing that inputted the data or not. So I, that is one kind of shortfall I see. I mean, we could have the most beautiful website in the world, but if the content on it isn't good, it's, it's useless. So <laughs> I'm just wondering, how do, we, how do we tighten that up? How, what is your process between IT and the other departments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, so, so again, so we're focused on the technology side of that equation, making sure that the tools to run the website function, that it's hosted well uh, and protected. Uh, so, so we do work with business units uh, on those overall configuration pieces. Uh, we did also recognize, though, that, as I mentioned earlier, there has been some ambiguity on responsibilities of who does what uh, and who you can turn to um, to to address issues such as the ones that you raised here today, which is why we sparked off a, a governance review, uh, which we're completing over this quarter. Uh, and then out of that will come a list of actions uh, and hopefully a, a lot of communication to the rest of the organization to make it very clear uh, how we will govern that and, and make changes to it moving forward. Okay, that's great, and I and I think you know sometimes I just I just feel like when I go through it, it feels like we just layer something new on. When something's not working, we just create a new layer, create a new layer, create a new layer, and the onion analogy, wallpaper. yes, um, the wallpaper analogy, <laughs> you know. But and but it's it, it doesn't make it so user friendly. And I would love to um, hear more about how this governance pro review that you're doing is seeking to address these issues and streamline. Um, the functionality because as other councillors have said, this is a, such an important tool for us, for our constituents, for you know, the corporation in, in how we you know, function. So um, I know it's a convoluted, complex system and I thank you for those of you that you know, keep it going. Um, but those, those would be uh, what I'd be looking for in the future, some more information about that government review. Thank you, governance review, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. There are no further speakers on the list. Are we ready for the question? Questions. Okay, the question has been called. Ian? Thanks, David, you want to share which council is most problematic from an IT perspective? That would be me, Councillor Mancini. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. That, uh, that motion has passed. Thank you very much, David and Heather. The, the next item on the agenda is uh, proper, property, fleet, and environment. So if we could have John and his team uh, come forward. Thank you.
And good morning, John, and, and welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm John McPherson, Executive Director of Property, Fleet and Environment, and very pleased to be here today to present the 23-24 Budget and Business Plan. To my left is Jenny Buinis, who's our Business Unit Coordinator, and she'll be running the slides today. Next slide, please. So our mission is delivering sustainable management of fleet, buildings, land, and ecosystems while taking meaningful action on climate change to support a healthy and resilient future for our residents. So next, I'll be speaking to the five service areas of PFE. First off, uh, corporate fleet led by Trevor Harvey, responsible for the life cycle management of vehicles and equipment. Uh, it's a diverse fleet and includes uh, units such as uh, fire, police, uh, public works, um, all vehicles with the exclusion of transit buses. Corporate real estate is led by Peter Stickings and they're committed to supporting regional council priorities through real property acquisitions and disposals, industrial park development and sales, leasing and accommodations management, and advisory services. Environment and climate change, led by Shannon Miedema, provides leadership in climate action and environmental sustainability. Leads the implementation of Halifax and develops and oversees projects, policies, and programs to protect ecosystem health, reduce emissions, and adapt and prepare for the impacts of climate change. Uh, I'll take this moment to uh, advise that Following this presentation and Q&A session, uh, Shannon will be presenting on Halifax, which is something that was requested by Council. So uh, there'll be a Q&A session after her presentation as well. Facility Design and Construction, led by Philip Duganzik, provides professional design, construction services, and project management services for municipal facilities. And finally, Facility Maintenance and Operations, led by Diane Chisholm, ensures clean and safe municipal facilities for all residents, customers, and employees. Supports approximately 240 municipally owned buildings through preventative life cycle maintenance planning, and also pro provides for corporate security. Next slide. So a few slides uh, about us to give a, a glance of the business unit. Uh, facility design and construction uh, it's delivered $41.6 million in construction projects, spread over approximately 75 various projects. Uh, for corporate real estate, uh, have delivered uh, $3 million in property, various property transactions. Uh, industrial lots sold 56 acres, equating to $18 million of revenue for HRM and uh, a major economic driver for HRM as well. Uh, real estate manages 450,000 square feet of lease space. And on the environment side, municipal facilities, greenhouse gas reductions, We've seen 12,500 tons of reduction since 2018. Uh, since 2008, we've seen a 34% overall reduction. And finally, uh, six net zero buildings constructed or being designed to date. Next slide. Continuing on. Uh, with some of our highlights. Facility maintenance and operations maintains almost 3 million square feet of municipal facilities and sees about 14,000 work orders per year. On the fleet side, we have uh, over 1,500 vehicles and equipment that are maintained by that department. Uh, they see about 25,000 work orders per year. And I'll finish up with some uh, community energy uh, numbers and um, uh, community emissions do fall under the, the purview and the influence of Halifax. 
Uh, since 2016, Halifax has seen 7.4% reduction in emissions and community-wide capacity of renewables almost seven, uh, seven megawatts. Next, a uh, few slides to highlight some of our successes. Uh, Burnside 13, phase 13.1 under construction, and that's gonna supply 120 acres of new industrial land for the region. Again, major economic driver. Uh, 150,000 square feet of lease space or leased or renovated space by corporate accommodations. So really driving ahead our, our corporate accommodations program, modernizing. Facility design and construction completed uh, numerous renovations. Some of the highlights, uh, Woodside Ferry Terminal, which we're very pleased with, uh, Dartmouth North Community Center, and um, new uh, library, uh, lobby area at Alderney Gate. On the new build side, uh, Fort Needham washroom building, which is a great asset for that park, and the McIntosh Depot, uh, which is, um, we've received our occupancy permit last week, so we're working through the transition plan, uh, and it'll be great to see that much needed resource come online. Uh, for fleet, uh, vehicle use policy has been put in place as well as an AVL policy. And on facility maintenance and operations, uh, completed a green, a green belt project which improves the uh, efficiency of how we're running our city works program and streamlining the, uh, the steps that go along with that. Continuing on, uh, the Halifax location of the modular units uh, was completed uh, early in 2022. Uh, Corporate Fleet has purchased 39 hybrid electric vehicles in 2022. We would have liked to have purchased fully electric vehicles and we're anxious to do so. Uh, market factors are preventing us from really capitalizing on that. Uh, 19 million in solar installations through the Solar City program. Uh, and the municipal electric vehicle strategy uh, included an RFP for public electric vehicle charging, and uh, that RFP is, uh, is issued or is, is tentative to be issued. So um, it's great to see that, uh, that public aspect coming forward. Uh, a couple of awards uh, that Halifax has received, uh, a Clean 50 uh, and Climate Change Leaders Award from the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, and Halifax was actually named uh, top project uh, for Clean 50, uh, voted on by, by the members. And finally, uh, launched Lake Watchers, a community-based lake water quality monitoring, monitoring program. Uh, really nice to see that uh, uh, community engagement and partnership that uh, can fall under Halifax. A uh, number of slides here to outline our current and planned initiatives. Starting off with growth and asset renewal projects, Halifax Commons Aquatic Project, so the new Commons Pool uh, is well underway. Uh, Ketch and Goodman Library Renovations, um, renovations and a, a, a small expansion to accommodate the growing uh, need in, the, in that area. Uh, Ragged Lake Transit Center expansion is, is near tender ready, uh, and that's gonna accommodate the uh, first big delivery of uh, electric buses. Uh, Fire Station 2 design work uh, progressing, and the Qantas Grams Grove Park building uh, is, uh, is near completion. And I just wanted to flag uh, an aspect of that building. Um, uh, before starting, the design team met with HRM's indigenous advisor um, at the time. And uh, um, some of the, the collaboration and, and themes that came out of that, uh, that meeting worked, its, worked their way into the, the design of the building. So very pleased at, at how that's turning out.
For inclusive communities, uh, accessibility projects are always uh, a key focus for our business unit. So diversity, inclusion, and, and accessibility principles are incorporated into all new designs. Uh, we have a number of small but impactful accessibility projects such as ramp upgrades, beach mats, and new universal washrooms. Uh, preparations are underway to meet provincial access by design requirements. Uh, we have an auditor engaged to take stock of our buildings. And uh, we have five employees in the business unit that have uh, Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification. And those principles are applied to all the work that uh, they do. For prosperous economy, uh, sufficient supply of industrial lands is a key focus. Burnside Industrial Park Phase 13.1 is uh, well underway. Uh, the various phases of uh, 13 are being considered in, the, in design and uh, future work being uh, looked at from a planning perspective. Uh, Regular Lake Industrial Park secondary planning background studies are taking place. And a huge piece of work, the Integrated Mobility Plan Land Acquisition. So a huge undertaking uh, involving a number of landowners um, over Bayers, Roby, and Young. Moving on to uh, the environment. And uh, just a, another reminder that Shannon will be up after this uh, to present further on Halifax. Um, so working to increase protection and health of ecosystems, undertaking municipal natural assets inventory, water quality management work, and watershed management. For net zero emissions, so as I mentioned earlier, our new constructions are targeting net zero uh, status. Uh, deep energy retrofits of municipal buildings is a huge uh, part of Halifax. Uh, we have a roadmap uh, put together that lays out uh, which buildings are gonna get retrofitted and when. And uh, we've operationalized that. Uh, recommissioning is a, is a great low cost, high impact piece of work that's ongoing. Uh, we're aggressive on oil conversions, which a uh, upcoming slide will reflect. And uh, environment and climate change are working on a community retrofit program to, uh, to help facilitate, facilitate homeowners to uh, retrofit their homes. Uh, again, net zero emissions, decarbonizing transportation is, uh, is a major piece um, guided by the electric vehicle strategy. Uh, again, sourcing of electric vehicles is, uh, is a major hindrance at the moment. We'd certainly like to be uh, further ahead on that. Uh, and electric vehicle charging infrastructure is, is part of that plan. Under climate resilience, looking at climate risk management, hazard mapping, uh, increasing resiliency of critical infrastructure and preparing communities. For administrative priorities, service excellence, uh, performance excellence is a continues to be a major focus for PFE, uh, CityWorks Greenbelt project to streamline those process processes were a major success, and we're building on that for a phase two. We put in place numerous service level agreements uh, and we're seeing the benefits of those. And finally, uh, a dashboard as well for facility maintenance and operations that's gonna show uh, the performance of our individual buildings. Under well managed, Corporate real estate is working on an industrial park administrative order, uh, as well as a less than market value leasing admin order. Fleet is, look at, is partnering with FIRE on a FIRE apparatus uh, optimal life cycle project. Uh, we've initiated vehicle compliance, vehicle safety programs. 
uh, fleet lifecycle replacement, uh, working on performance measurement and progress reporting for Halifax, which again, Shannon will, will highlight in her presentation, and mainstreaming climate action and building capacity. And it's, it's really great to see the, uh, the support that environment and climate change is getting from both internal HRM employees as well as the general public. Finally, um, our people, health and safety workplace, um, health and health safety and wellness is a is a is a big focus. Um, we're having all uh, our staff first aid trained uh, to be ready for provincial regulations and to uh, you know to accommodate the flex work environment that we're seeing. Corporate accommodations policies focusing on improving accessibility and inclusivity in the office environment, as well as improving ergonomics, operational efficiency, and functionality. Uh, it, it's very important for us to, um, to ensure that everyone feels welcome and safe in their workplaces. Uh, next slide. Now for some uh, KPIs. We'll start with operating cost per vehicle. Uh, this graph pretty clearly shows an increase year over year. Uh, the highlights to those operating costs are uh, generally two things, uh, increasing fuel costs, which we're all seeing, uh, as well as inflationary costs for parts, which is, uh, again, something we're all seeing. Next slide. Facility maintenance work orders. This outlines demand versus planned. We can see the demand work orders increasing, uh, partially uh, due to uh, the return of staff and um, after COVID and, and uh, more activities in our facilities. Our goal is to increase the planned work orders, which is the preventative uh, maintenance aspect. And we're hopeful the uh, performance excellence Work uh, that's being done for City Works will help enable that to happen. This next slide outlines our corporate accommodations footprint. So you can see on the left, the uh, trend is fairly flat in terms of our total owned and leased office space. Well, on the right, you can see a year, generally a year over year increase in the number of workstations being accommodated. It's due to an, a number of factors. So um, changing the size of our workstations to something that more reflects uh, modern, modern workspaces, as well as uh, taking advantage of flex work arrangements and really um, playing up uh, you know, multi-use collaborative spaces. I'm quite pleased with this slide. Uh, it shows our um, uh, reduction on uh, oil consumption. Um, we have a target to get to zero usage in 2030. Uh, we've accomplished this through conversions, generally converting to um, electric uh, heat pumps and uh, natural gas for our larger facilities. Uh, as well, we've, be, we've been able to uh, offload some surplus facilities. And I'll finish up here on the KPIs with some environmental numbers. Uh, for corporate emissions, we can see a downward trend since uh, 2016, and uh, I'll allow Shannon to speak more to these uh, when she's up. Uh, for community-wide emissions, uh, since 2016, we have seen uh, a decrease. Uh, and again, we reflect this, these numbers because community emissions do fall under the, the influence of Halifax. Number of solar energy systems installed through Solar City. Um, can see a, a slight dip over the last couple of years, um, you know, likely due to uh, to COVID and some other factors. But uh, to date, since 
the initiation of the program, we've seen uh, 757 installations. Okay, uh, I'll finish up with a few slides on the operating uh, numbers. This slide outlines our staff counts. So um, in our 22-23 uh, numbers, we had 204.8 full-time equivalents. Uh, what's being proposed in the 23-24 budget is uh, 206.8. It's a total change of two for our business units, for our business units, sorry. Um, under, I'd like to point out that under Halifax, we've been able to hire three positions which have been transferred to other business units. So uh, that demonstrates the influence that Halifax has uh, HRM wide and that we can um, secure these resources and uh, place them where they're, where they're best needed. Next slide. This slide covers our changes from last year on operating budgets. So last year our budget was 44.2 million. Uh, this year 48.1 million, which is an increase of 3.9 million. Uh, some of the highlights are uh, a 2 million projected increase in fuel, uh, again due to the rising costs of fuel over last year. Uh, and we have approximately 1 million in OCC uh, this year, which is uh, the result of new, new builds um, and new assets coming online. Um, we've mitigated as best we can. Uh, we've projected some increased revenue and uh, a number of other cost reductions. At the end of the day, <coughs> excuse me, uh, inflation is playing a, a large uh, part in our increases. Uh, this is our last slide. So we're bringing forward three options for consideration for um, options under budget. Uh, I'll point out that generally PFE operates as a, um, a service provider to our business unit partners. Uh, so somewhat challenging to come up with uh, significant numbers. Um, the first option is reducing cleaning contracts for some of our facilities. Uh, that's a savings of 100,000, um, and that's reducing the, um, the level of service. Um, second item is reducing contracted services for contracted labor, uh, $50,000 savings. <clears throat> uh, you'll see the Amira Oval and Lebrun highlighted there, and the reason for that is that those two facilities are operated by a third party. Uh, company and not operated by HRM staff. Uh, and finally, reduce the facility equipment replacement budget of uh, 200,000. Um, that obviously comes with big impacts. I think we can all think about our own homes and, and not spending money on our homes and what that, what that results in. Um, but we'd tackle that through reducing preventative maintenance work and um, really being strategic with uh, what equipment gets replaced and when. Uh, so we'll finish here. This slide uh, shows the new uh, renovated Woodside Ferry Terminal, a major success for, for our group this year. And uh, happy to take any questions. And just a final reminder that uh, this Q&A session will be followed by the Halifax presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. We normally, um, someone normally puts the motion on the floor right away. I'm wondering if it would be possible to have the Q&A session for Halifax uh, at this point, and then we could have the Q&A for that with no motion on the floor, and then move ahead with the, uh, with the motion. Move to the presentation. I'm sorry? Move to the presentation for Halifax. Move to the, uh, the presentation and the Q&A for Halifax. And, and do the vote at the at the end for everything. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, certainly. Uh, the plan was to have them separate, but if that's the will of council, then yeah, that's. Uh, oh, so so you were you were thinking of the the PFE budget and then the helipad Q and A following the vote on that. Uh, that's correct. So the intention was to present the uh, the PFE um, business plan here. Okay. As a standalone presentation, and uh, the Halifax presentation, we took this as an opportunity to bring that forward, as it was requested by council uh, back in November, and we felt that this was the best time to bring that forward. But again, uh, it's whatever uh, council requires. We're we're here to yeah. to present and answer as needed. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Uh, sort of clarifications for, for those who are watching uh, at home more than those of us that are here it's all part of the, the budget for Halifax is already in your presentation so to me it might make sense to have the Halifax presentation now since it's not a new budget and then we can have all the questions that would be my view but um, and, and I would agree with that yep thank you Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Shannon. The floor is yours. Am I on here? Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Mayor Savage and members of council. Uh, I know this is a little bit strange, but um, very happy to be here to give a little more detail on Halifax, how we've been implementing the plan so far, uh, a bit on our progress and getting into a little bit of the financials. Um, we were kind of asked to present not only on our second annual progress report, but also um, go, go back a little further and then project a little more into the future to help with budget deliberations. And sorry, I'm Shannon Miedema, Director of Environment and Climate Change. I was expecting to have a break before coming to speak in front of you, but all is well. Um, and I won't take too much time here. Uh, John already mentioned a lot of the, the successes um, that we've seen in the last year and couple of years since Halifax was passed in June of 2020. Um, in short, we really have a lot to celebrate. We're moving full speed ahead across a whole lot of different um, policies, projects, initiatives, barriers, uh, and we're making a lot of headway and we're building our momentum. Um, in addition to Clean 50 and the NSFM awards, uh, we were, our team of environment and climate change was recognized with a CAO award of excellence uh, before Jacques uh, left the organization, which was really nice um, to kind of recognize the efforts of a small and mighty team that has been working hard on all things environment and climate for a long time in this city, well before Halifax was developed and adopted. Um, and we also received an A grade uh, on our greenhouse gas reporting this year, which is actually quite difficult to achieve, um, and it's part of our commitments through the Global Covenant of Mayors that, uh, that we've signed on to collectively. I could talk a long time about a lot of the big initiatives. John covered a lot of them at a high level. Um, a lot of what we do focuses on really enabling the efforts across all of the, the business units of HRM and with our community. So it's a little bit of that, it's not just corporate, it's community wide. So where we're, where we're focusing is on, you know, setting a charge rate for public electric vehicle charging infrastructure, getting our RFP out uh, hopefully this month on the first round of installations for public charging on the EV side of things, supporting our transit team and all the amazing work that they're doing. Um, I hear they have their first electric bus that they're testing out right now, which is really exciting. And uh, I think there'll be some rides in our future to, to partake in that. Um, on the building transition side of things, um, 
you know, we actually have an administrative order to build to net zero. So we are requiring of ourselves to the highest standard around energy when it comes to our municipal buildings. And we've been making a lot of good headway lately with our retrofit program. Um, we are running a couple of pilots starting this month where we're actually be going to be going into some willing homeowners uh, houses and actually testing if the measures will get us to where we need to be, if the financial business case and all of the rebates make sense for those homeowners to actually say yes to a deep energy retrofit while also considering renewable energy like solar and looking at protecting their homes and their properties from climate impacts like flooding. Uh, we just got a big final report from Dunsky on the financing options we would have for this type of community-based program and we've awarded an RF FP for the development evaluation framework. Um, so we have a consultant looking at Solar City to help us come up with a program that is much more universal and accessible to all property owners going forward. Um, on climate resilience, um, we're, we're well underway with some really detailed flood hazard mapping and we also have work happening by a consultant on other types of climate hazards so that we can spatially layer all of these on top of each other working with our IT department um, and then look at the vulnerabilities so social environmental infrastructure community vulnerabilities and it's really going to help us get a framework for making hard decisions on where we invest and when in preparing for climate impacts going forward. And a couple other pieces on the environment side, in addition to the Lake Watchers program, which was really successful this year, a lot of community buy-in and participation. Uh, it's really gonna help give us a good sense of the health of our lakes and hopefully some good strategies going forward to improve their health. Um, but we also uh, are now a bee-friendly city. We've got bee-friendly city status. Um, and we are well underway with updating the Urban Forest Master Plan because we have a contract position now in place for a year to update that strategy and uh, she's with our team half time. So that's really great too. Um, and in thinking about presenting, uh, I just always keep coming back to that it can't all be measured. And um, the momentum that we're seeing, the, um, the recognition, the new partnerships, the new asks to present or to go visit different businesses, et cetera, just keeps growing and snowballing for us in Halifax. And really one plus one doesn't equal two when it comes to the efforts we're putting into climate change and the results that we're seeing. Not everything can be uh, measured and tracked uh, in dollars or in KPIs, um, but I re like we in my team, we see and feel it every day that, that there is a shift and it's really, really exciting. And an example that I'll just talk about for one minute happened this morning uh, with Mayor Mike Savage and CAO Kathy O'Toole at the Halifax Partnership where we had our first signing of a CEO Climate Action Charter. So um, we interviewed uh, about 30 CEOs over the last six months and co-created a, a document that commits them to further climate action within their organizations. And these are major employers and business leaders and institutional leaders in our community. And so that happened because in the economic recovery strategy, we layered in that our efforts should not be counter to climate action. So we shouldn't bail ourselves out by digging ourselves into more of a hole when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. And that led to a relationship with uh, the Halifax Partnership and my team more closely on what does it mean to actually say green economy, climate action. We created a working group. Um, this is act, the charter is actually a, an action in the new five-year economic strategy which has a green economy theme to it for the first time ever. And the impact that these leaders can have across our city is, is, is not to be you know, ignored. And so I'm really excited that we're digging in with partners to really leverage their efforts, their dollars, their energy to try and collectively succeed in um, our plan. Um, I could talk forever about Egypt, but I'm not going to do that. But there was a lot of great conversations and connections and things that have stemmed since we've returned. People reaching out, asking to go to conferences, you know, speak at different events, uh, collaborating on some of the barriers that we're working on uh, has been really fantastic. Um, 
We've got a lot of new initiatives underway for only being um, kind of two years into the plan. Uh, really excited that tomorrow we're launching a uh, kind of passive climate education campaign in all branches of the Halifax Public Libraries. It's been a great partnership with them, um, really to kind of get uh, a better sense of where the public stands right now, what their questions are around climate change and what they can do, and then we'll actually respond to what we hear by providing further um, campaigns going forward. We just did a big uh, public lecture series in partnership with Dalhousie University with the School for Planning and Architecture um, for multi-hour long sessions, really well attended at uh, the Halifax Library. Um, and we're still running our climate action challenges uh, through the Innovation Outpost with community groups and there's videos um, and all kinds of great things going on from that. Small grants are given and training on um, them testing out their climate solutions. That, that's all part of the puzzle. We've leveraged a lot of funding across the organization on climate related work. Um, our team, it's about four and a half million this year that we've leveraged from other levels of government. Uh, transit's about 135, buildings about 10. Uh, so we're really working to stretch our dollars as far as they'll go, which is really fantastic. Um, and on the communications and collaboration side of things, uh, I think it was covered a little bit in IT's presentation, but really excited about this idea of a virtual hub for Halifax uh, for the public and all of our stakeholders. Um, we have a new position coming on board funded by the resource plan for the climate change plan. So the resource plan for Halifax, one of those eight positions this year is a marketing advisor that will sit in corporate communications but is dedicated to climate and environment communications. So really excited about that as well. So just to go back to the start a little bit around how we started uh, paying for climate action, um, we got our, we received our first ever capital account for things other than energy efficiency strictly uh, in 2021 with a budget of a million dollars. And that was really to have a pot of money to be able to leverage all the funding opportunities that we were seeing and sometimes missing because we didn't have matching funds. They come and go pretty quickly with the, uh, with the province and the feds and we wanted to be able to actually get a piece of the pie and get some work done. Um, and to enable projects that were already budgeted and happening in other business units to be a little bit more climate aligned or a little bit greener um, than their budget would allow. And it's a, so it's a bundled account that was put forward and approved back in 2021. Um, and then fast forward to Halifax approval in June of 2020, just three months into COVID, um, you know, the plan was passed without a specific ask for resources at the time, but the, the motion was amended um, to say, you know, staff, you really need to tell us what it's gonna to take to not fail at this plan, to actually get moving on what you say we need to do and act with urgency on climate change. And so we came up with a three year, fairly high level resource plan um, based on discussions across the organization of what we thought it would take in terms of FTEs or full-time staff and operating dollars, while at the same time developing a detailed four and 10 year capital plan for the capital climate project work that was needed. And that all came to you under the umbrella of the strategic initiatives funding conversation at the time. So the climate action tax. This is my attempt as a non-finance expert to talk about the climate action tax in a way that isn't financy, recognizing that the finance experts are in the room should I misstep. But I thought I would just walk through this for a couple of minutes um, because I've heard a lot of conversation and questions where it's obvious that there's some confusion and misunderstanding and it is confusing. And um, so I'm just gonna try this. <laughs> Please bear with me. Um, on the left, we have the property taxes provided by property owners in HRM. That property tax feeds into the general rate, which is how we have staff. It funds positions uh, in HRM. And for climate change, that means the operating dollars in our accounts um, for things like communication, education and awareness, our retrofit program work, 
uh, some of our preparedness for, for climate emergencies, work in community, things of that nature. And then last April, uh, Council approved this climate action tax, which was really um, a solution provided by finance to help smooth the impact of the needed investment over time for climate change. And so it collects $18 million a year for maybe 10 years or however long it goes for. Um, and it's really to service debt, should we be taking on debt to service these capital projects. So the CAT is just for capital work not staff and not operating dollars, not for our, 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 our operations. And the numbers were developed from the detailed capital work plan of Halifax and also the work that was already ongoing with transit that already we had been working for a couple of years to secure the funding from the province and the feds around the first 60 electric buses, the charging at Ragged Lake. So that's phase one of e-buses. That plus the buckets that we have in our shop for Halifax, that is what the CAT collects for and only that. Um, so basically if you t back out uh, from 180 million, the cost of servicing debt, you basically have 153 million, which is that bottom green stack. We've secured 74 million in cost sharing across all of these green buckets of work that the CAT covers. And then there's still an unfunded 199 million in the out years of the 10 year capital plan um, that finance is working on solutions for to provide next year. I want to make sure I covered everything I was going to say. Also, um, basically this climate action tax covers the, did I just say this, the first four years of the capital plan for Halifax and e-buses phase one and not the subsequent years. I said that. Okay. And it's really about smoothing the impact and ideally, um, the impact to property tax rates over time. Um, it's supposed to take the pain out of higher dollar asks in future years. And Fiona, our finance expert, actually had a really great, I was trying to think of an analogy that made sense that finance would agree with on what this is trying to do. And it's like the equal billing um, payments that you can set up like for your home heating as a homeowner, where you pay the same exact amount all 12 months, even though you're only using a little bit of fuel or none in the summer and more in the winter. So you actually, you know, from a cash flow basis, you know what you're paying all year round and you don't have any uh, surprises. And I thought that was a pretty nice way to think about it. So those green bars are, is that collection of the climate action tax over 10 years and the blue is the first four year ask um, of Halifax. So this is our, um, capital budget breakdown over the years beginning in 2020 when we got that first million dollars through to 26, 27, uh, not including the bus account. That account is with transit. Um, and it's purple in the first three years because it was just one account, one named account uh, for climate action. Starting in April, it's actually now subdivided into the big buckets of work to increase transparency and help with project management. Um, the black dotted line is the actuals and projected spend. And you can see that it looks low in 2223. We were given almost $10 million of capital this year, but six of that is actually committed. Uh, it's just not moving out the door this fiscal and will be carried over for electric vehicles, for uh, work in progress, energy retrofits in buildings, solar installations. We've got some large corporate solar installations in the works, our flood hazard maps, and a bunch of other smaller projects. And then this is uh, the environment and climate change operating account and you can see it's increasing over time as our kind of roles and responsibilities have increased to implement the climate plan. Um, 
And you can see where the three-year resource plan kicks in just this year that we're in right now, year one. Um, the orange is non-compensation -comp costs and the blue is compensation and benefits for staff. Um, and uh, that, that lift is from um, exactly what the resource plan called for. So it was 25 jobs over three years was the estimation of what it would take to get us moving at the right speed. Um, and we, we had eight this year, which is really fantastic. Um, and we had anticipated eight for next year and then the remainder nine for the following year if we were gonna stay on course with that resource plan, which again, we developed uh, in consultation with the different business units. And it had a, an operating cost increase of about, I think, three and a half million dollars over those three years um, to really drive projects forward across the whole business unit. So we got a lift in the non-compensation uh, side of things of 45% of the total ask of that operating increase this year. Um, and we've reduced our ask for next year by 600,000 as part of the process to manage the budget constraints. And the eight positions that we had anticipated asking for, we are not asking for this year. I believe you may have spoken about one of them yesterday, uh, which was the Green Network Plan coordinator position. Um, the other seven that we were anticipating was a manager of adaptation, um, a coordinator for the retrofit program, some junior positions, and some policy analyst positions. And just uh, a reminder that, you know, we're talking about spending, spending, but um, I always like to say that this is an investment and that we are actually saving a lot of money with the work that we're doing, especially on the, the buildings energy side of things. Um, and there's also a real benefit to acting now to avoid future costs. Um, we've actually run a little experiment since Hurricane Fiona, where we've been, uh, and, uh, our team actually set it up in advance of the hurricane coming where they created a stat order in our system and asked everybody to code all expenses to that stat order just as an early, like, can we actually capture what the city spends uh, in the wake of a hurricane such as Fiona? And um, it's not done, it's a work in progress, but right now we're at 2.3 million and counting and that doesn't even include any capital costs. That's all on the operating side, so. And the other reminder is that the reason why we're asking for this upfront larger investment in people and in money is to really try and address the, the work we have to do in the time we have to do it. And I've shown this different versions of this graph <laughs> over the years. Um, the first orange box is when we declared a climate emergency January 2019 and the bottom is when we're gonna exceed our carbon budget in about 2027. And we're you know pretty much in the middle of that. That's a week per square. So I am keenly aware of of the, <laughs> the narrowing window of time for this work. And so, you know, there's a lot of talk across the board and globally around um, how difficult it is to actually find consultants to do the work, get EVs ordered. We just keep getting rejected for our orders, you know, that type of thing. Those are the barriers that we're working hard and fast on right now, trying to find creative solutions and we need some, uh, to keep kind of going with that, with our, the resources we have now and hopefully with future resources in the future. And just briefly, this is our summary of progress over the two years of the Halifax plan. We are mar marginally more on track than we were uh, in the first year because we had some more positions, some more money. Um, we've done a lot on mainstreaming the climate plan across the business units. We've got a whole change management effort in play. And uh, I think that's really gonna get us going faster further in future. This year's really been a foundational year with a lot of work happening to create the conditions for success if we can keep going and keep um, capitalizing on the momentum that we've created. So our team grew from two to 16 uh, in pretty short order. So we've actually set up a, you know, a management structure with buckets of work and leadership in place. Um, Caroline Blair Swift, Blair Smith is our executive sponsor for change management around Halifax, and we had a governance model approved by the senior leadership team just in the fall um, uh, with Jacques there as well. And we're gonna be launching these working groups um, that are across divisions to really try and um, 
move some of those barriers and make some more meaningful progress going forward. Uh, a lot of foundational work on the charging infrastructure and rates for electric vehicles and risk and insurance and IT. We've ha we have a big working group on that. Um, and I think I've spoken enough about some of those other ones. I know I'm probably going along here. So this is my last slide. And um, really just to summarize, I think we're in a really great place. I think we have a lot to be proud of and that we're leading on um, both internally and with our partners. And um, we don't plan on slowing down in spite of uh, the curveballs and the barriers that are in our way. This is an adaptive plan. It was created knowing full well that we don't see the path clearly ahead on climate change. Uh, we don't know what and when the impacts will be. And we know that uh, you know there's changes to policy and rebates and legislation. Uh, always happening in the climate space. And so we're prepared for all of that uh, adaptation that we need to do and we plan to just keep doing our work responsibly but with urgency uh, and capitalize on this momentum. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, Shannon. Um, we do have a number of uh, people on the, uh, on the list who will be asking questions and I would ask you to uh, hold your questions strictly to uh, Halifax uh, after uh, we have gone through a number of questions here, then we can move into uh, the motion and the full budget on PFE. So let's start with uh, the Deputy Mayor. Go ahead. So you don't want me to put the motion on the floor? Okay. Yeah, they're all part of the same. My understanding is this was uh, asked to be a Q&A on Halifax itself. So uh, my preference would be unless, John, you're comfortable with uh, the motion going on the floor at this point? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, yes, I think at this point, if it's a, a general Q&A, um, that's, that's fine. Okay, super, thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Austin. Well, um, at the risk of straying off, I don't know if this is general Q&A or not. Um, I mean, I think, you know, really when I looked at today's agenda, the, the Halifax the main, is my main interest here. Um, it very much is the challenge of our times and it's not some distant challenge as, uh, you know, I think anyone who's looked around at our own weather lately where we've had basically one day of winter so far and we're in February, it's pretty uh, apparent that it's uh, the, the challenge is upon us. We're talking about a community that used to sell ice from Lake Banook and race horses, used to skate, all that's gone. And of course, we've uh, ha also had the most devastating storm in our province's history and also in PEI, Newfoundland's history. So this isn't some distant challenge. And, uh, you know, when we look at our budgeting, it's, uh, it's challenging, but the, the challenge for us is the atmosphere doesn't care about any of that. You know, we're not negotiating, I think it's an Elizabeth May quote, we're not negotiating with the atmosphere here. Um, it doesn't matter. And uh, I have to say, Shannon, I hate your graph that shows those tables because, oh my goodness, you look at how little of our carbon budget is left and how short a time we have to make monumental change. And we're not gonna fix the problem here in little old Halifax, but neither will anyone else um, if we all collectively just hit the snooze button on this challenge, right? This is, a, this is the greatest challenge that our species on this planet has ever faced because it requires us all to work together in a way that we just never have. Like we don't have a global government that can just say, you shall do X. We all have to do our part and hope and work with others to try and try and make sure everyone carries the load on this. And so my question with all that in mind is, goes back to John's slide, where we have a 600,000 reduction in the Halifax resource plan as the councillor that you know modified the original motion to say we need to actually have a plan to make this, which took a year to get to us, and then we got the resource plan. Are we now cutting? like not actually delivering on what that plan is calling for to make, because we're, we're not gonna achieve this if we don't actually put the people and the resources into it. Mr. Chair, through you to the Councillor, thank you for that. Um, the 600,000 reduction is, is not cutting us off at the pass. Um, 
the ability to move all of the, so we basically got a lift of $1.55 million in operating into our cost center in environment and climate this year, but the intention was for it to move projects across the organization. And just with the, you know, working through the processes of shared accountability and responsibility for the different 46 actions and, and getting the kind of systems in place and just the awareness that there were dollars um, that could be spent kind of post business plan and budget processes last year meant that it was, we moved a lot of the money and we have most of it soft committed, but you know, there was some that was not spent this year. Um, and we thought, okay, because we're still in early days of change management and we're still, um, we have a lot, you know, on the books for next year, that that reduction ideally isn't permanent. Ideally, like we'll still get those resources in out years, but that we we wouldn't need to take all of that second third uh, second third yeah of the of the chunk of the resource plan straight away next year. So, what actually are we doing this coming year? Are we continuing? Are we continuing to staff up, or are we not? So sorry, that six hundred thousand is not the jobs, so yeah, the, the losses that are being um, for next year's budget, like the things you're not seeing are 600,000 in operating, like consulting dollars, contract services, that's, okay. that's that 600, plus the money that it takes for eight new full-time positions. So, sorry, are the eight positions in or are they out? Mr. Chair, through to the councillor, they are not in. They are out. They were not. They were not put on, um, and they kind of, they don't exist, right? They were. To, they were new positions to be created. So it's not like they're showing up as deleted positions, uh, but they're also not being asked for on the bow. So why? Why is like given the importance of this plan, and you know, I mean, council launched a dedicated tax for this. Why are those eight positions even? not identified then for us as an, as an option to add to, this is, this is probably, uh, I don't know if this is a John question or actually a Kathy or a Jerry question, but like why are those eight not identified in the presentation as something for us to add? Because if we don't have the people, we're not gonna succeed. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor. Um, those eight positions, uh, we do see them coming up in, in a future year. Um, it's just in terms of this year, it's, it's uh, Shannon mentioned, it's uh, somewhat foundational. Um, you know, we want to hire people on at the right time uh, so that everybody's being effective. So for this year, we're not, we weren't considering them, uh, but certainly, um, you know, an upcoming year they will be on the table. So I'm out of time. I will come back. Um, I, I, I need, I, I'm going to move a motion on that one. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, CAO. Thank you, Kathy O'Toole, CAO. If I could add to the discussion. Um, I, I think this is a, you know, the, the approach that Shannon and John have brought forward is, is a wise one that I think all business units should be encouraged to be doing, not adding new positions until they're actually needed. And the climate is right for them to deliver the work. And a lot of that depends on organizational readiness and also external market factors like when certain types of equipment or consulting services can be engaged. But also, I did want to point out that we will not let lack of human resources hamper us achieving, you know, the direction council's given us on Halifax. And if we have mid-year resource requirements, you know, where we're looking at something and saying, oh gee, I wish we had brought forward that new position this year, we do have a way to address that mid-year you know, through filling a position um, with funding from other sources and dealing with it and making it permanent when we come back in the next budget. We also have the option of realigning other resources. So um, how we align resources and, and when they're reflected in the budget is really, I think those, those um, 
recommendations are best coming from the people closest to the program. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I just wanted to, the motion wasn't put on the floor. I, my understanding was we were, this is one budget item. So I thought we were discussing, asking questions of both people. So the motion would appropriately be put on the floor now, would it not? And questions could either go to John or to Shannon or anybody else? John's, uh, John is uh, comfortable with the motion being on the floor now. So uh, whoever speaks next, next Councillor Mancini, not mentioning any names. Um, you are welcome to put the motion on the floor and then we can open it up to anybody. Um, our CFO would like to add something to the, uh, to the information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and <clears throat> just, just with respect to the last question to Shannon on, on the reduction, just want to clarify for the committee, right? Because I can sense the question might come up around that. Positions in the resource plan are not funded from the Halifax, not funded from climate action tax, right? The climate action tax is for the capital delivery piece of the projects, right? The operating pieces are on the general rate like all other positions. So just wanted to clarify that there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jerry. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Mancini. I'll put a motion on the floor for you, Mr. Chair, that the, um, the Budget Committee direct the Chief Administrative Officer to incorporate the property, fleet, and environment proposed 2023-24 budget and business plan as set out and discussed in the accompanying plan and supporting presentation of the staff reported dated January 23rd, 2023 into the draft 2023-24 operating budget. So moved. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Do we have a seconder? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. To follow up on the, uh, the conversation Council Austin had, and so, and the comment that uh, was made not adding new positions until they're needed and making sure people closest to the program are responding. So my question to you, Shannon, is what is the impact of not having those eight positions in 2023-24 uh, uh, year? Mr. What does Chair, it mean not to have those positions? Right. Mr. Chair, through you to the council. Yeah, thanks. That's a really good question. And um, right now we're actually filling a couple of vacant positions that we have within our team. Yep. So look, you know, if I think about how how we're distributing the work right now, um, I know that it's going to get a little bit easier as we fill, which we're planning to do in the next couple of months. Those those um, few vacancies that we have um, will help us to continue moving forward and go a little bit faster. Um, it's really, the tension is really about the, the time that we have to do the work that we need to do. So, um, you know, our team is definitely very busy and stretched, uh, but we are leveraging, you know, our partners and using consultants as we need to and working across the organization uh, as we need to to do the work. So Shannon, are things we cannot do because we don't have a, pos uh, a position filled? I think, I think across the organization there are capacity issues that would refrain you from doing a particular project or just diving in on something that you know is a problem. If I think about, you know, everything I would like to do in the run of a day, I definitely don't get it all done. Um, you know, there are some big initiatives that need to move forward, especially with the governance model for Halifax and actually supporting these working groups. Like, it's actually a lot of work. And, and because we've created this management structure in our team, we have four kind of buckets of work, but they're very lean. There's like two, three people on a team total, um, and we're kind of missing a bucket. So there's definitely um, a strong case for needing to grow the team to, to push forward on all pieces of the plan, but we understand where we are with um, the current budget constraints, and we're trying to follow kind of the asks um, yeah. that we're putting in front you of know, us. Many of our departments can make the same claim. They are very lean and trying to get, uh, and so I'm anticipating Anticipating uh, Councillor Austin's motion, what that might be, uh, for me, I have to understand what does it specifically mean by not having uh, those eight positions. And, and, and you talked about filling in a few vacancies. That's separate from these eight positions. Is that correct? Yeah. 
Uh, okay, I'm going to, uh, where am I? Talking? I'm going to follow up on that conversation once I see what Councillor Austin is going to bring forward. Um, trying to come back to some other smaller items here uh, with regard to your presentation, Shannon. The, the um, Lake Watchers program, you talked about uh, good buy in. Uh, can you explain and maybe remind us all, and this, some of this was led by my original motion, but what's the, what's the I guess, similar question, what's the benefit, what's the impact of this Lake Watchers program? Where does it go from here? Mr. Chair, through to the Councillor, yeah, um, the Lake Watchers program is basically a revamped, reinstated program that uh, used to exist for the city uh, where we monitor uh, over 70 lakes now across the municipality for lake health parameters. And it's really to help us, we basically lost our kind of baseline health check of lakes when the program was canceled and was canceled for so many years. And there's really no one else doing that work um, at other levels of government or otherwise. There's different active community groups for specific lakes, but this really gives us a really good picture of lake health across the municipality, helps us think about policy decisions when it comes to development and, and other types of things. Um, and uh, it's it's different this time because now it's actually involving the community, so community groups can do the sampling themselves with assistance from the city. Sure. We pay for the equipment, et cetera. Yeah. Just as my time is running out on this item, uh, so we identify, we're monitoring, we've identified an issue and a problem. Where's the province on this? Because as we all know, that it's the province who's responsible for these lakes. So is there a tie-in to them? Are they getting the data? Do we have a direct communication with them? Mr. Chair, through to the councillor. Yes, we've been working with the province. Um, they are, they're happy that we're doing Lake Watchers and uh, you know we're also working on a lake management framework uh, that we can apply across all lakes uh, of our city and uh, talking a lot about uh, multi-stakeholder lake management or watershed management because that's really what it comes down to. Um, we're basically fixing uh, with band-aids, some of the problems we're seeing in our lakes, like blue-green algae, high bacteria, um, and a lot of it is land-based problems, and so we need to think about more deep solutions like to those root causes, mm -hmm. and that requires provincial and other partners to be involved, so yeah. Okay, my time is up. I'll come back in, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Mancini. Go ahead, Councillor Outfit. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, John and Shannon. I'm going to, my first time up here, I'm going to concentrate on questions for Shannon, I guess, and then, John, you'll be the lucky winner after lunch, I guess. Um, so thank you for that explanation and the graphs there on the on the 3% on the tax and the $18 million that was, because there's a lot of confusion around that, um, I think, around the table to some extent, but certainly out in the, in the public. Um, so there's a few things to trouble me, and, and Jerry, I'm gonna pick on you for a second, because you just mentioned that this 3% goes into the, the tax, and that's capital only. I'm not sure we can be that rigid. And I'm not sure, and if we've learned anything from Brad, uh, anguish, I think, isn't he now starting to budget things where to implement this capital project, to undertake this additional paving, to undertake this street calming, I'm going to need this person. And that person's not going to be there forever with the organization for 25 years. That person is going to be there to implement this uh, project, this capital project, and I think should come out of the 3% tax for a climate impact. Okay, so if we needed to hire somebody to help design the electric charging uh, facility in, in Burnside, and that required a person, I do not understand why that person in charge of that capital project couldn't come out of the tax uh, assigned to implementing that project. That's what we told people. We told people this just isn't about buying battery buses. This is about preparing us for climate change and to try and mitigate climate change in our little piece of the world. And that's gonna mean people and policies as well as capital projects. So I did not tell people, but in addition to the 3% tax, we're also gonna to have to hire eight people a year. Or three people a year or whatever to implement this. So, and there's all kinds, and, and of course I have concerns, are we, and this is more of a question for Shannon, that we also keep an eye on hydrogen and hydrogen buses. So here we go, we buy all this wonderful infrastructure for electric buses, and three years from now, 
the, the way to go is, is hydrogen buses. So are we going to be able to pivot on that, that terrible word? Uh, and of course, I wanted to find out a little bit more about the, the good thing that Councillor um, Morris brought up yesterday is the green network and how does that, there's something else. Is that going to come out of planning? Is that going to come out of Halifax? Is it going to come out of environment? Uh, and, and how we're going to fund it. But anyway, Jerry, my, my first question is I don't think we can be so rigid to say that that reserve specifically for the environment couldn't help us hire person, persons to implement that capital project. Thank you, uh, Councillor Outhit. So just a couple of things just to bring everybody back. Staff have been very clear, right? There's a resource plan. Yeah. for Halifax, which is the staffing up Shannon, building up her team, right. right? That the funding from that comes from the general rate. That's like funding, you know, regular hires, employees, et cetera. The 3% action tax, very clear, lots of discussion, lots of transparency. That is around the capital delivery of the Halifax climate action strategy, okay? And that, that's, been, that's been clearly explained. Now, what I will say, and if uh, I'll go back to my, my uh, business presentation, we do need to take a look at, at the long term, right? As John said, we are in the foundational stages, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, when we started this, uh, we didn't have this level of uh, inflation, uh, this challenging labor market, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things me and my team are talking about is really looking at, at more the long-term view because quite frankly, we're probably not putting enough money into to the strategic initiative reserve to, to be able to deliver on Halifax, right? I'll bring you back, Mill Cove, right, is a, is a huge project. Right, there wasn't much discussion on that during the capital budget as well as Burnside Transit Center is, is, is coming uh, up as well. That's like another like hundreds of millions of dollar project, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna look at that uh, reserve business case, right? Because you, you, you might have a point, there's, there's probably some things that could be of an operating nature that we could use that strategic initiative uh, reserve, right? We just set it up last year, council approved it, and, and the business case is specifically uh, related to uh, debt and principal on, on capital projects. But we're gonna, uh, part of our work this year around our, our uh, finance and fiscal sustainability strategy is look at our, our long-term debt financing and our reserve strategy. So you, you do bring up a good point there, and it, it has been noted that, that we might need to uh, re, uh, reimagine what the business case on that reserve looks like. Thank you. And, and thanks, Jerry. I'll come back to John, my questions to John, but I, uh, Shannon, I did want you to comment a little bit on the, the green network and on uh, hydrogen versus electric, if we could, just to my, answer my questions. Thank you. Mr. Chair, through you to the Councillor, yeah, thanks for your questions. Um, so I think there's space for both electric and hydrogen buses. Uh, we are, you know, on paper formally a, a supporter of the initiatives that are happening in our city now and the work that people are doing um, around green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's a lot happening with the port. There's a Atlantic Hydrogen Alliance that Kevin Bootlier on my team sits on. Uh, there's a big contingency from Belgium coming tomorrow uh, to have a half day on hydro green hydrogen and wind. Uh, there's a lot of interest in that space, but it's not, it's not to replace uh, the benefits and need for electric buses. So I don't think we're putting, I don't think we're forking into okay. like a wrong path with that. Right, and with the eco rebuild for Burnside, they're looking at, you know, designing the space to be able to accommodate both electric and hydrogen buses. So that's really great. Um, your question around green network plan coordinator. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't hear the conversation yesterday, but I heard that it was around maybe asking what is the connection between the green network plan and Halifax? Is that? Yeah, and, and uh, maybe Councillor Morris will want to speak to this more afterwards. But again, again, it was a situation where I think Councillor Morris, as I recall, wanted to have a, a bow list about should we hire another person, the cost of that person, to which 
and I guess I've had some of the wind taken out of my cells today, I, uh, by Jerry there, I said that, well, isn't that something that could come out of Halifax? Isn't, isn't green part of environment? Isn't that part of Halifax? And is there not money somewhere to staff up Halifax, so to speak, in addition to putting another person in planning? So that, that was my thinking. She may have different thoughts. Thanks for the clarification. So yeah, we as the we had been planning for the eight jobs next year that we right. thought we would formally ask for. One of those we had had conversations with planning and Parks and Rec around um, the need to really move forward with the green with yes. implementing the green network plan, just like the IMP, just like the climate plan, yes. just like all of our plans, yes. and really that it required a body, okay. a full time body. And so we knew we were going to get, or we thought we were going to get these eight positions with the resource plan, and we thought that one actually is very well aligned and integrated with Halifax. Yes. Um, we have actions around conservation and nature-based climate solutions, yes. and it's, it's both mitigation and adaptation. It makes a lot of sense for us, and we're at a time where it's really important to be paying attention to those things in this rapid development kind of environment. So that was actually, right. the intention was for Halifax to fund that position, but through the operating resource plan side of things. Okay. Yeah. All right, so that helps clarify. I'll come back on the others, but there's, there was my point on this was that a, we're trying to find funding sources, and B, I think most of us detest duplication. So I just wanted to make sure. I will sure ask you to come back, there. Councilor Arthur. So I will come back to ask questions for John after lunch. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Councilor Smith. <laughs> thank you, Chair, and thank you, Shannon, for the presentation. It's always great to have you here and get grilled by Council. Uh, so so my, my biggest question was around the, uh, the 600,000 uh, and for clarity, for, for my understanding, so what you're saying is the reason that that was a reduction was due to the, the vast amount of work that needs to be done and understanding that this, uh, the, all that's included with the 600,000 wouldn't really be able to be spent in the way that you're hoping to have it complete. So reducing it, understanding that you will be coming back or that will be back in the budget at some point when you can allocate those funds. Is that, is that a, like a simple clarification for that? Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor, yes, you're correct. Okay, so, so hearing that and, and you know, um, we're taking your expertise, I, I would, I'm comfortable with seeing that reduction, understanding that you're, you're, you will come back when you know it's time to, to move forward with that. And yeah, I also when I saw the presentation, seeing the blocks, that's a little scary. Uh, seeing how, how much little time you have left. And uh, I, I thought it was funny too with your presentation with trying to uh, break down the, the property tax and the, 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 the um, environment tax, not trying to make our financial folks upset but you started another slide with saying one plus one doesn't equal two. So, so you already started off in a place where you might have got our, our accountants in, in, in the room a little, a little want to flip a table. I'll, I'll, so, so most of my other questions are for John. The other piece, the other question I have is related to when do you think the next community update will come forward? Um, and the, the last one is, is this, this is actually I, John, you'll have to answer this now because maybe when we come back to you, you get, uh, but understanding that the Auditor General did ask for us to, well, when I'm saying us to, well, us to create a fleet rationalization plan and monitor the light fleet, will that plan, if it's complete, I'm not sure that was going to be my question to you, John, will that plan also kind of work around what we're trying to do at Halifax and, 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 and deal with the emissions related to our fleet? So, so um, you don't have to answer that now. We can do that after lunch. Um, but I just want to kind of give you that first a heads up that I do want to know how that fleet rationalization plan does connect to Halifax and our reducing emissions on our, our own fleet. So if you have any comments or questions or, or comments on what I've said, that'd be great. And I'll come back to you later, John. Mr. Chair, through to the Councillor, I think you asked about the, the next community update that Corporate Comms was supporting us on, and that's intended for late this month in February. And I think uh, we were thinking quarterly, I'm not sure if we'll do it four or three times a year, but yeah, we're developing that right now. Okay, great. And just on that piece, would you include some of the information on COP as well and all, okay, all that great stuff? Okay, cool. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. And I'll come back after lunch. Super. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Uh, Councillor Lovelace. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you both uh, for this report and, uh, you know, bringing forward um, just an incredible amount of work. You know, this, <laughs> you've got a big team. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot under uh, what you're doing and certainly uh, there are pieces um, that some of us uh, in council uh, feel are missing like the Green Network Plan and, and, and the connectivity um, to that work. You know, uh, there was a statement yesterday about, um, about trees, you know, looking at environment as, as trees when in fact, um, our economy depends on nature. Uh, ask any community that has experienced a significant fire like Fort McMurray or, or California, and, and the list goes on, and you see the drop in the economic value uh, for those communities, the loss of jobs, um, you know, the skyrocketing costs of health care, and, uh, and that's all ongoing. So I think it's important for us to um, look at uh, our involvement. I just want to give a shout out to Jerry and his involvement in working with the Intact Center on the climate adaptation and the and the research that's been done out of the University of Waterloo. And you know, while I I, I heard what you said, Shannon, about the difficulty in actually monetizing nature and monetizing environment, we are putting environment on the balance sheet because it has to be there again because it underpins the economy, not just of our community, but of our province, of our country. Um, and so when we think about the impact of uh, stormwater costs, just looking at stormwater costs and the damage that that can do if it's not diverted properly and managed properly, it's enormous. People lose their homes. Um, so, you know, we have to continuously look back at, you know, how do we monetize the work that we're doing for environment, which means the work that we're doing for communities um, and the economy, but also the cost of not doing that. And so, you know, thinking about that kind of economically sound balance sheet and how we ensure uh, that we are using adequate and appropriate numbers to tell the story, you know, and, and I love how you told the story about, about taxes to help people understand. Um, because we struggle with that. And you know that we struggle with that because we come to you, Shannon, and say, oh my gosh, we need help explaining this. Uh, because we understand it, but it's difficult when we don't have a cultural climate that looks at nature and environment as an economic tool. So we are changing the culture, we are changing the conversation to ensure that people recognize that the very, very important work that we're doing here isn't because we think, oh, trees are nice, or oh, the, you know, the environment's important, but it's because we're looking towards the future to ensure that we have a sound economic future. And so the decisions that we make today can either degrade our environment or support and sustain our environment. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm interested in looking at hydrogen. I want to know more about the geothermal, uh, geothermal uh, potential that we have. I want to know more about uh, the connections between the people, uh, planet and prosperity and what, I, what I'm hearing today around people, policy and projects. And making sure that the people, policy and projects isn't just sitting within Halifax, but that it is connected throughout all of our business units and that Every staff member, every manager, every business unit is aware of why we're doing this work so that there's an opportunity for someone to say, hey, you know what, I've got an idea. Here's something that might be missing in this policy or here's something that we could add to that project. And I, I agree with my colleague uh, at the end of the table here that thinking about the connection between operations and capital is completely necessary. It's lovely to have great capital plans but kind of useless when you don't have the people to actually do those great plans and, and, and uh, implement those projects. So I, I, I just, I wanna encourage uh, my colleagues here to think about um, the natural environment and not only the protection of that natural environment as an investment in our future, um, but ensuring that we are capitalizing on the economic tools that are within the environment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yes, and, and, and I'm sure Jerry can speak to this, there is an evolving understanding of what it means to have an economic outlook that includes nature. And costing that is really difficult because 
quite frankly, eco the economy hasn't necessarily thought about what it means to monetize the environment. And I'm not talking about selling trees. I'm talking about, you know, the, the cost overall and the opportunity to protect that wetland, which then results in, um, you know, the, the, the sustainable community where houses are not lost be from flooding. And so um, I recognize the good work that you're doing. I think we're headed in the right direction. Um, you know, I guess the moral of the story is nature is valuable and we need to make sure that we cost for that and we have that included within our, within our, our balance sheet. And I think that that's something that, that we're headed towards. I just would like to see us get there faster. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, John. If it may, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair, uh, through you to the councillor. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I'll just mention that we are, well, first, little known fact, I did my master's in ecological economics where oh. I actually valued yeah. nature. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I know a lot about that. Right. And really excited about the work we're doing in um, natural assets inventories, right? So we, we've inventoried all of the natural assets in HRM in partnership with a nonprofit called the Municipal Natural Asset Initiative um, out of Ontario. And we have now uh, contracted them to do a phase two piece of work starting now and moving into next fiscal okay. uh, in the Nine Mile uh, River Shed. And it's really to look at how do you put some dollars around, like there's there's lots of tensions around doing that, but it actually does get it on the books and so that you can see, okay, this watershed is giving us you know, high level estimate right. this much value. Okay. And if we, so now we know what it's gonna mean if we make decisions that um, reduce its ability to perform in the way that it functions. So really excited about that. Uh, another thing on, uh, you know, the whole across organization work that we're doing is um, developing some training uh, that will likely be mandatory training for all staff that deliver council recommendation reports on kind of environment and climate and like nice. the resources and, and you know, exactly. pointing to the different staff in the different pockets to help provide guidance to those reports around environmental implications and really beefing that up. That's an old yeah. motion of Councillor Zorowski's yeah. and I'm the bottleneck right now in approving oh. the modules. So that is <laughs> that is ongoing. Uh, the change management work is really, uh, I'm really excited about that. And um, we also uh, are revitalizing the internal stakeholder network that we uh, first brought together when we were developing the climate plan to be like a change network. And there's a lot of people really excited from all different pockets of the organization. And we've had a couple of meetings and they're kind of co-creating what they want that network to look like. So okay. we've got a lot of different kind like of it. pieces ongoing around that. Good work. Thank Shannon. you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Let's break now for lunch. And we will be back here at 1 p.m.
Okay. Ian, the mic is yours. I'm, I'm just going to call us back to order first. I'd like to welcome everybody back to the Budget Committee uh, from lunch, and I'm going to hand the mic to the clerk for a minute. Oh, we're good? Okay. The speaker's list is set. Uh, Councillor Morse, you are next on the, on the speaker's list. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to uh, John and Shannon for your presentation so far. Uh, you have uh, a very daunting challenge and uh, you're approaching it in a way that is not only uh, getting accolades from around the country, uh, it's groundbreaking and it's, it's never easy to be a groundbreaker, but I just want to congratulate you on your work. You've laid a great foundation. Um, what I wanted to ask you about was uh, if you could tell us a little bit more about the risk uh, mapping that your team is working on, um, specifically related to our coastal communities. And is that going to be going forward this year? Uh, and if not, what would the risks be for infrastructure and what would the risks of a delay be in that area? And um, also, could you talk a little bit more about um, how uh, the Green Network Program Coordinator could have benefits across the municipality, not just related to climate, but to other um, departments and um, making sure that we value our uh, natural assets. Thank you. Mr. Chair, through to the Councillor, thank you for those questions. Um, so on the coastal side, um, the work being done by the consultant is aiming to be done by late June or, or early July. Um, and it's based on the new LIDAR that we have for our municipality, the new digital elevation model that was created and surface elevation model and um, taking the most recent international climate science from the latest uh, report on estimated impacts and we've localized it to Halifax. So we originally earlier this year did an extreme water levels update and that's being incorporated into the analysis as well. Uh, CBCL is doing that work for us. And, um, uh, and then WSP is doing the other hazards piece. And then emergency management's working on the um, inventory of critical infrastructure. And we've actually supported the uh, contract position to manage the full update of the hazard risk and vulnerability assessment for the municipality, which is legally required um, and needs to include um, evacuations under flood scenarios and all kinds of climate pieces alongside everything else. There's just a lot of interconnections on that. And they were needing a resource to move that forward. So that was uh, that came out of the resource plan money this year and, and is committed for the subsequent two years. Um, and and also a, a software solution uh, was also paid for as part of that to even be able to do that update. And the intention is to have a working group, like I mentioned before, uh, around the governance of the implementation, focused on um, our critical infrastructure and having resilient critical infrastructure. Now, the leader of that group was going to be our one of our climate adaptation specialists. She's left the organization as of December, and it's a vacancy, and we currently don't have a manager of adaptation or resilience in, in the city, which is one of those eight positions that we'd been anticipating. So right now, it's kind of being shared across um, uh, planning and development as well as PFE staff. <clears throat> um, and there, you know, work was done on vertical setbacks for coast for protection around development when re, uh, with some updating, updated planning rules, which is really great. Um, so there's, there's no delays on that work. It's just the lead of that work is now gone. And, and we've actually, we're about to post that vacancy right now, looking for another adaptation specialist. On the Green Network Plan Coordinator, um, I've been talking with a lot of other directors and staff across the different business units of HR on like a gap that we're seeing around like cohesive conversations around conservation, around nature, around ecosystem health, and how it's kind of a shared responsibility across multiple 
uh, business units, but it's not really clearly defined. And you know, the Green Network Plan is being held by planning and development right now without any resources. And so we had been brainstorming you know, what would be a good solution for moving the needle forward because of all the co-benefits. You know, it's Parks and Rec, it's planning and development, it's PFE uh, and others. And um, so we thought that that would be a nice kind of place to start and, and have a working group around nature um, as one of those pieces of our governance model. Thank you. Just on the, just following up on the last thing you mentioned there, um, are are you seeing other cities using models where they have someone who's um, looking at a similar type of position to coordinate those activities? That's a good question. Um, We've done a lot of talking across cities in Canada around like how they've set up their, their climate team or their environment and climate team. They sit in all different places. They're done really differently. Some are really big, some are small. Uh, I can't think of an example of a, a coordinator um, around Green Network Plan or something like that, but um, that's not to say there isn't one. I guess we do have a bit of a unique municipality too where we have so much, such a wide region, such a diversity of, um, you know, geography, and uh, so perhaps this would be another groundbreaking thing that we could do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morris. Go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and um, yeah, thank you for the great work that you've been doing. Um, I mean, the breadth of things that uh, you take care of, everything from washrooms to, you know, the Halifax, um, you know, it's the whole whole kit of caboodle in there. Um, I had a few questions. Um, some for John, some for Shannon. Um, one is about you know the mobile units. So I see the mobile units that we set up fall under your department, and um, and then we have like the campsites, which fall under Parks and Rec. And I'm just wondering like, how that works between our response to homelessness and how we're coordinating through the different departments, and in particular, how we're accounting for this in, in the funding allocations, but also in the reporting back of, of you know, what, what we're actually spending on these initiatives and, um, and how we're measuring uh, the success or the impact on it. Um, the other question was about, was about washrooms and the bathroom strategy. And you know the need to kind of really get some more public bathrooms into our public spaces, into our public parks, and how we can do that cost effectively in, in a fast way, not just in our parks that are on water and sewer, but also looking at our parks that are on well and septic. And are we, where are we with our bathroom strategy and where can we see that going in the next few years? Um, you know, I was just, a, I, I had a memory photo pop up of the bathrooms in Regina where they have this one style of bathroom, right, that's replicated everywhere. It's very versatile and hardy and, you know, well, well built structure. And, and you know, you, you see a lot of public bathrooms. So I, 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 we don't even have public bathrooms like at the Mumford bus station, for example, and I realize that's at least situation and maybe that's transit's responsibility or is that your responsibility but overall we we really need to get our our public washroom and bathroom strategy up up and up and rolling including how it fits into our transit strategies um uh really impressed with the oil conversion Th those were impressive numbers and um another question i had was about uh, lake watchers so there's, I know we have a number of lakes on the lake watchers list. How many of those lakes actually are doing water sampling? And by who, how many of them, because are they being sampled by HRM if there's no volunteers? Or, or is it completely volunteer driven? And where are the results being posted? Like where can we find, where can we find that information? It's something I think I've looked for before and it's not, uh, all that obvious if it's out there, but um, you know, we talked about the website before. It's a Lambeth. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, that, uh, that is, those, are, those are my questions from now. Um, I had to leave partway through your presentation there, so I'm kind of going off my notes. Mr. Chair, through you to the councillors. So I'll start with the modular units. So property, fleet, and environment was responsible for 
uh, getting them uh, designed, delivered, put in place, and set up. Uh, Parks and Recreation um, is responsible for seeing, overseeing the operation, and there's a, uh, uh, a contract in place with, um, a, with the province for service uh, provider. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the ongoing costs, our facility maintenance and operations has some role in maintaining the units, uh, but not the overall operating costs. So that really rolls up unto, under a Parks and Rec uh, uh, purview. But we'll get a full picture of everything. Like, uh, yeah, I understand uh, the accounting on that is, is done uh, fairly routinely. So um, that information is available. Uh, in regards to the washroom strategy, so uh, again, the washroom strategy falls under parks and recreation, and uh, property fleet environment um, carries the capital for design and construction. Um, we work together to set the priorities and set the schedule. Uh, we started off uh, trying to do one, one building per year. Uh, for budget reasons, we've, we've scaled that back a little bit, but um, uh, the Fort Needham washroom is an example of one, the Graham's Grove washroom building, uh, the upcoming Metfield building is one, and that's outlined in a capital plan. Uh, and what about and with transit? How does that work at transit stations? Uh, the one you referenced, um, uh, sorry, it was um, Mumford. Mumford. Uh, that is, I understand, a lease facility, so uh, transit would have some input into that. Certainly, new facilities that we're building would have washrooms included. That one, I would say, is a, a legacy, legacy one. Thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. You are welcome to come back. Go ahead, Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor. So lake watchers, yes, um, all 76 lakes are sampled in spring and summer. Of the 76, there are 15 being sampled by community groups and supported by HRM, and the remainder are covered through a consultant that we hire and pay for. Um, all of the first season sampling is on our open data portal, and um, the second season of last year is about to be launched on it. And after this year of sampling, so that we have two years worth of data, we're doing a full lake health report card, social media kind of um, rollout after this summer. So there's a full-time Lake Watchers coordinator position and then a junior position under that that um, we have approval to fill. Yeah. Thank you very much, Shannon. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, this is my first time speaking, just for those who are wondering. Um, so my first comment was for John, and then I want to have some discussion with Shannon. So my comment, and follows on what Councillor Cuddle was speaking of, which was amazing work on those modular units. I don't know that people really understand. Nothing frustrated me more than media would call me and say, they're delayed, they're delayed. It's unbelievable. You know, we bought a motion to council, I did in late August of 21, suggesting that we would put $250,000 or something into supporting homelessness. We were gonna get used modulars, we found out they weren't acceptable, so sometime in the fall we sourced these other ones, and in early January, right, I think it was the first week in January, uh, we had the first modular units open in uh, Dartmouth, and then our part of putting the modulars in was finished in March, I think, or in long, before, they, before the province was ready to sort of move in. I don't think there was a faster construction project in Halifax during COVID than that. I mean, it's extraordinary. And I want to acknowledge Bird Construction, because uh, you and I had a chance to go visit them before Christmas and congratulate them on the work they did and thank them. You know, our folks and their folks worked over Christmas that year, putting these things together. I mean, it was really impressive work, so thank you very much for that. Um, Shannon, so you and I get to spend a fair bit of time together again this morning at the CAO uh, a charter, but you've come to lots of meetings I've asked you to come to, and we got to spend a bit of time in uh, Egypt with Sarah, uh, and it was really, it's, it's always impressive. And you know, I, one of the things I'm a, 
I've always considered the environment a key issue, but certain things have twigged me. One of them was when I went to Glasgow for COP over a year ago, and I was asked to be part of a, a number of panels, but one of them was on nature-based solutions. So I thought, I've got to talk to Shannon, and she gave me some information. But I also called Megan Leslie, my old buddy, and I said, you know, I was hoping she'd be there, and she wasn't. And I said, tell me something that I can use. This is one of the things I used to ask my parents all the time, right? Tell me something I can use. And she sent me a note that said, just tell them that a mature silver maple tree can absorb 220 liters of water per hour. I think that's a pretty impressive fact, right? Uh, she also indicated that we could meet 30% of our Paris targets through nature. Like there, you know, one of the things I've always done, but I didn't realize the importance of it from a nature-based solution point of view on climate change was when I would go and to promote Halifax. I would show them the downtown. I would talk about the economy. I'd talk about the students. I'd talk about all that. But I would also show pictures of, of the Shaw Wilderness Park and uh, you know what we're doing at uh, uh, Birch Cove, Blue Mountain, Blue Mountain, Birch Cove. But there is huge impact to that, as people like uh, Sam have told us uh, for years. So that's a really important piece for us is that, that nature-based uh, solution. A couple of quickies for you. Your staff count is how many now in your department? So 16 right now. What was it two years ago? Half that. Yeah. And five years ago, maybe It was two, two in 2015. Tw two in 2015, and we're up to six. That's pretty impressive. That's a big escalation of, uh, uh, of people. And on top of that, we have the 3% climate action tax, which, as I said again this morning, and you've heard me say before, was something that was universally applauded by some people. So. Uh, which is, which is true. But we're making a major commitment on this, um, and your leadership in that is very important. The last question I have is, uh, on the gap you showed us, there was a $199 million uh, gap on a 10-year plan. Some of that could be made up through other orders of government, correct, right? So there's 70 some there as a cost share now, but as we get into more buses, we expect to end up paying a third of that cost as opposed to 100%. Certainly, I think from a federal government point of view, that's there, and we hope that the province would continue to support that. So some of that gap will be made up. We just don't know when or how yet or what, what program. Um, uh, and I think as other orders of government take climate as seriously as we do, that's something that I hope uh, that we will uh, see. Um, so, thank you, and uh, thank you both. You both do amazing uh, work for us. And I keep coming back to the, those modulars, John, and at the time we didn't realize it because we were under the pressure to build them, but there were so many other projects underway in the city that stopped or, or haven't been finished in that year and a half, and we're housing 64, 66 people. In, it's not perfect housing. It's not long-term solution but it gets them out of the cold, um, and that's an important thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And so, uh, you know, I, I, the conversation kind of got truncated there at the end um, as I ran out of time as things uh, sometimes do around here. Um, you know, I can appreciate where staff are coming from in terms of it being a challenging year, but I also noted a couple things, and you know, maybe this is where tre treating the witness is hostile. <laughs> um, you know, some of the words that are describing the work of the group about the, that there's capacity issues, that they're busy and stretched, um, budget constraints were mentioned. And so on this one, you know, yes, we all face budget constraints, but this is the very, very bottom of my list in terms of places where we should be trying to cut. Like we're trying to drive monumental change and we're not going to do it with no people. And so uh, I'd like to move that the budget committee move eight uh, or seven, sorry, since one of them is actually capturing Councillor Morris's uh, motion from yesterday. So I move that the budget committee move uh, seven Halifax positions to the budget adjustment list with a possible funding source as the 3% climate action tax. Seconded by Councillor Lovelace. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Ian, you have a copy of that motion? Great. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Austin. Thank you. And so, um, and this is, I didn't include this in the motion. And so, my question to staff is um, I think we need an actual detailed briefing here. I would like to know what these seven positions that were not uh, included in funding this year that were planned, what they are. 
what the priority would be among those seven if council were to say give two or three or four um, what that would mean in terms of like where we would go um, and of course uh, you know I, I know our finance people uh, don't like the second the second part of my motion here about the three percent climate action tax but I, I find the arguments of councillor out hit rather persuasive on this point um, that we shouldn't be so stringent about it and so I'd like to have some implications in that memo as to what you know possible funding sources beyond just the general rate and so that's the one that stands out so uh, I would I don't know do I need to actually motion for a briefing on this because I think there's a bigger piece one being the positions and one being a source of funding Thank you, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think a, a motion would be would be in order to give clear direction on on what we want uh, with respect to this because it will impact the budget uh, one way or another, right? So, you know, looking at the motion in terms of what's being proposed to fund these positions out of out of the climate action tax, that is essentially kind of like defunding your capital plan right now to fill these positions, right? So, I, you know, you could put them right, you could make the motion to uh, to fund these through through operating, right? Which 600,000 is like $2, $2 on on the, uh, the average tax bill, right? So it's kind of like, <clears throat> it's kind of like taking one-time money to, to, to solve a problem or, or, or funding uh, reserves. I will say, you know, to counsel out its question earlier, and I think probably can clean this up a little bit with my answer. When we talked about going away and looking at the business case for the reserve, when we speak about uh, using the reserve funding for operating purposes, is that there's probably some uh, smaller projects within the Halifax plan that can't be debt financed, right? So when you look at the strategic initiatives reserve, that funding is to pay uh, principal and interest payments on the debt that we'll take out. So we wanted to have that flexibility. To counter out hit, Hit's um, question about a position could be funded from uh, the reserve, it could be if it's of a capital nature. So for instance, if, if Shannon and John hired, um, you know, three people that were gonna install EV chargers throughout the city and it was gonna be for six months or a year, that would qualify as a, as a capital expenditure. Thank okay. You. So to kind of circle back to the, the, the question I have right now, which is, can, do you need direction to give us a briefing on this or, can, or is there enough here that uh, you, you staff would? I'm going to hand uh, the floor to the CAO for that. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to comment, now that I'm in my sixth week, <laughs> uh, that I, as CAO, do not have a comfort level with any of the many new FTE requests that are coming forward from any business unit, whether it's public safety, parks and rec, whether it's for Halifax, um, what you're gonna see on transit and fire. And I, w I think the debate and the discussion is great because it gives us a sense of what council views as priorities. But I think when we come back be between now and us coming back with the budget adjustment list, I want to get the executive team together and talk about all of the FTE requests. I'm not confident yet in how effectively we're using our existing FTEs and also whether we're doing enough across business units to share resources and forming teams across business units to get things delivered where we do have some capacity and also use of external resources, you know, the, the right mix of internal versus contracted resources. So 
I think the commitment I want to make is, is that, you know, if council puts something on the budget adjustment list, that's giving us a clear indication of what council finds as a priority. But I think there's a broader discussion we need to have as a municipality around effective utilization of the workforce so we can deal and with and rationalize all of these FTE requests. And I know we've got a very passionate and enthusiastic group of employees. It wouldn't surprise me that, you know, we've got executive directors and directors, you know, busy talking about their needs. And I just want you to know that in my experience with the municipality, if there's, there's, there's an initiative that needs to move forward mid-year or we're not resourced, I can't think of a time that the municipality wasn't able to find a way to deal with that. So we'll take that resourcing feedback away and we will come back with something that's probably a little bit more rationalized when we bring the budget adjustment list. And if council puts the motion on the floor, I would, for this one, to look at these additional eight FTEs, I think you should leave the funding source open enough that we can come back with a recommendation that makes the most sense. So funding, I have possible funding source. So, I mean, to me, the, the point of that is to leave it open-ended. I mean, really what I'm looking for is do I actually need to motion at this time and council request a briefing note on the, uh, on the role of the seven positions and priority of them? Because it would be good to know what these are. Um, so if I need to make that amendment or we can just assume that we'll get a briefing note, that's all I'm kind of really looking for. Do you need me to amend this? Uh, Mr. Chair, through the committee and circumstances, I think we can just add that in as a friendly amendment. That, there, that w together with a briefing note with respect to possible funding sources such as the 3% action tax and the need, the current need for the positions. Does that make sense? Seconder. Thank you, seconder. Thank you. That uh, motion is now on our screens. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Outhit. Well, back when I was first elected, every once in a while, I think it was Bill Karsten, some others, you'd say, there's the rock star comment of the day when we would have a discussion. And, and Kathy, there's the rock star comment of the day where it's exactly what we need you to do, and it won't be easy. Uh, and it won't be quick, and you're only six weeks in, but that's exactly what you said, what you need to do in your rule, in your new role over the next few weeks is to have this little look at, at FTE, some of which are required, some may not be. How will we finance them? How could they be moved around, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you, thank you, CAO. Um, the second thing, and, and, and uh, Jerry, you, you had a rock star comment there too, in a way, because you, you interpreted and said better than what I said, because that's exactly what I meant. And Sean and I had this sort of debate at, at lunch where I'm not saying the way Sam is promoting, let's uh, suggesting as a possible uh, source, Let's just hire you know five, six, seven, whatever people and pay them out of the uh, out of that uh, tax, the, the 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 climate tax. What I was saying is exactly what you had articulated, Jerry, was that if it meant we were going to implement this pro this certain project, be it electrification, be it a shoring up a shoreline, be it uh, retrofitting a certain building to bring in that resource on a temporary basis as part of the project and consider that a capital expense, I think made sense to me. And I think that's what you articulated very well a few minutes ago. So I, I couldn't support, I, I absolutely support the briefing note that, that Sam wants, but I couldn't support you know, hiring seven or eight people and taking them out of the strategic uh, uh, fund, the reserve. So just for, just for that clarification. But uh, I hope that we will get this briefing note and I'm really anxious to see what our, our new CAO comes back with, with a little bit of a, a rationalizing, if you will, or a, uh, a reconsideration of the RFTE counts. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ovid. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a tricky one. I'm not inclined to support this. Um, we've gone from two people to five to eight. We're now at 16 in a very short period of time. Um, on something that I've supported all the way through because I think it's hugely important. That's on top of the 18 million a year we're collecting in uh, property tax for capital projects. That's, um, 
that's a very significant escalation, and uh, I, I agree with it. I was a very vigorous supporter of the climate action tax and continue to be, and it was my understanding that it would be capital, and uh, so I, I'm, it's not something I would back away from, but I'm a little confused. I thought I heard the CAO say, and Shannon as well, that we probably couldn't hire these people even if you put them in the budget. Is that not what I heard? Shannon, uh, perhaps? Mr. Chair, through you to the Mayor. Um, no, not that we couldn't, but that, um, you know, there's a pace of growth that makes sense, and, and I think we've done it in a good way where we went up three and then six and then eight, um, and then it was to be another eight and then another nine as per the 25 over the three-year resource plan. Yeah. Right, but what I heard Kathy say was we can't do that, and if we needed it midway through the budget, or mid midway through the fiscal, they could come and ask for that money then. Is that not what I had heard? Yes, that was what you heard, but I was speaking in the context over, of the overall budget and the FTEs. For instance, we still have a fair amount of new FTEs that were funded, from what I understand, in the current year, year fiscal budget that have not been filled yet. So in addition to, you know, we've got the, the stuff you funded new in 22-23, there's some vacancies that need to be filled. We've got, I think, 260 vacant positions across the organization right now that need to be filled, plus whatever new ones get added through the 23-24 budget. So there's the matter of what we can actually hire and onboard, and then the second thing is all of these new FTE requests, if we do decide we need some, we won't have them all April 1st, right? So we have to figure out, you know, what we need and when we can hire it and, and spread them out throughout the year. So some of them might only be budgeted for, for example, three months next year or six months, not for an entire 12 month period. So there's no way we would then put the money in the budget for positions we know won't be filled. That would be foolish in my view. Yes, I would agree. I mean, it seems to me that I'm looking at this and I've had a lot of discussions with people who don't like the climate action tax and have called me up and I've supported it vigorously, I would have a harder time if they say, well, you supported the climate action tax, you've increased your staff who are working on this from two to six to 16, and now, you, and now you're giving them more than they even asked for. Um, that to me is like, that's a, that's a step beyond, um, especially if we know that we, you're not gonna hire uh, eight or six or seven position starting April the 1st under any circumstance. Um, so I, I wouldn't support this. Now, in terms of the climate action tax, it was my understanding, as I said, this was, was capital. Uh, but, you know, I, I would say we're, we're collecting 18 million a year on that, correct? So if we decided and we were able to do it legislatively to say that we're going to take, you know, 4% of that or whatever this amount would be to help, help fund some positions on an ongoing basis, and the case was made that that was sensible, I would, I would do that. Um, so I, it, it's, a, it's, an, it's, it's a tough one for me because, you know, I'm proud of what we've done. There aren't many cities that have done this. I think there's, there's only one other city I know that did anything. It was 1.4% out somewhere in BC or something. That doesn't mean that people aren't incorporating it into their other budgets. We've isolated it and dedicated it, and we've taken the hit for it, and I have no problem with it because it's the right thing to do. Um, but to go through a budget process where we're asked for this much, after what we've already done, and then say, well, maybe we should give you more when we're looking at other positions that may have to be cut. Um, it just seems a bit, at this point in time, seems a bit much to me. And if, if it goes through and on the ballot and comes back, we can consider it then, but I'm probably not inclined to support it uh, at this point. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you. Um, I won't be able to support it either. So a number of things. So first of all, the funding source, which has been talked about and staff have explained, and it was clear when we did this, that the climate action tax was being collected to go into reserve. That reserve was going to pay the debt servicing cost for the capital that we were buying uh, for mitigation for new projects, electric buses, the, the rest of it. So if you start siphoning off some of that, legislatively allowed or not. If you start siphoning some of that off, then you have to increase the climate action tax to pay for the capital we said we were going to fund out of debt because now we've got operating stuff going, uh, so the funding doesn't make any sense. 
and, and no disrespect, Shannon, but when you had in your uh, presentation, uh, or maybe it was John, I can't remember, uh, we called it the CAT, the Climate Action Tax. Let's not call it the CAT. That was the old ferry from Yarmouth that cost billions of dollars and we don't like it. Let's not call it Climate Action Tax the CAT. Um, climate action doesn't just come from, and to the mayor's point, and to what the CAO and, and you guys have already said, climate action is an entire organization-wide effort. It's not found in one tiny little unit of a couple of dozen people within one department. <clears throat> Transit, for example, is one of our best climate action departments. Rapid transit strategy, getting more people out of cars and into uh, buses. Land use planning, stopping car dependent suburban sprawl, uh, thickening up our neighborhoods, adding more density, which makes transit actually more affordable. Um, think about parks and our naturalization strategy, more parkland, that's climate action. To the mayor's point about you know using nature. Transportation planning, our functional plans, you know, adding more active transit, uh, more dedicated bus lanes, all these things are climate action. And they're costing us tens of millions of dollars and hundreds, when you think of the capital, hundreds of millions of dollars for all those things that doesn't reside in, in Ms. Miedema's department. That's all climate action. So um, as I understand it from what the CAO said, we've got 260 unfilled positions within the organization that could easily be moved around at, at uh, you know, her leisure, really, it's her staff, and also the fact that um, within the department, there's some vacancies, I and mean, you have to fill the, the uh, one that just happened in, in December. So in their presentation, they didn't bring forward the positions. The CAO has already said, we don't need them just yet, and we might not even be able to hire them all anytime soon. So I'm not even sure why we would want to just preemptively say, well, you know, I, I understand staff, you, you, you can't hire them and, and you don't even need them just yet, but we're going to give them to you. Like that doesn't make any sense. And so uh, I, I can't support it on, on all those levels, uh, which is not to say I don't think climate adaptation, mitigation, and uh, our strategy to uh, be resilient and, and actually bring, at some point, carbon down and become net zero, but it's not gonna happen because of eight positions this year. Uh, it's all of the entire HRM working at the government level, and then, of course, move up to the province and the feds, and at the community level. And we're doing so much, and we're having such great progress, as has already been shown. And so, uh, you know, let's let that progress unfold uh, and let the CAO get her legs under her uh, within the organization and then see what comes from that. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, uh, uh, on that note, Councillor Cleary just suggests the CAO does have her legs under her. Um, and I greatly appreciate the approach of the fact that, um, you know, we have to look at the, at the larger picture of the organization. Uh, there may be staff that needs to move. There may be funding that needs to move. Uh, there may be, um, you know, sustainably, sustainability issues that uh, arise as soon as, um, you know, we, we get another six months in uh, with this new approach from our chief administrative officer and I just I, I greatly appreciate it and you know it, it certainly with an organization this size having 260 unfilled positions isn't catastrophic it's certainly not unusual in the climate that we're in right now um, but I do think that if uh, you know as as we've heard from Shannon we can't do a piecemeal approach we have to make sure that we're all in right we have to jump in with both feet um, and ensure that we uh, recognize um, the, the, the comprehensive approach uh, to climate action within every single business unit. Um, certainly, uh, I appreciate uh, Deputy Mayor Austin putting this forward. I think that um, what I'm hearing is we do need some flexibility, uh, and at the same time, we know that we have to scale up depending on what comes our way, uh, whether it's uh, new funding commitments from the pro uh, from the federal government, I'm not going to say from the province, but from the federal government. Um, you know, I think that uh, we saw a huge federal announcement um, uh, just yesterday uh, from the federal government with regards to health care. Climate change and climate action is intrinsically connected with health care and well-being in our communities. Um, so I I'm not opposed to getting a briefing, no. 
I, I really don't think uh, getting a briefing note uh, would be a, a disservice. I think actually um, it's better to have more information to ensure that we recognize the future goals and uh, whether or not we can hire these folks uh, this year or following year. I just want to know that we have a plan and ensuring that everyone in this chamber is aware of what that plan is um, and ensuring that it is funded appropriately. Uh, because if it's not funded appropriately and only planned, we're gonna just send ourselves back a few years where we were when everybody said rah, 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 Halifax, but there was no money behind it. So, you know, with, um, with a plan, has to come funding and also resources. We need the bodies to do that work. Uh, so I'm happy su to support this uh, for a briefing note. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Lovelace. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so far today I've heard uh, not adding new positions until they are needed. I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, you know, speak to the people who are close to the program. I think I and many of us have done that. Uh, the clarification of the climate action tax not, is not for resources, for capital, and, uh, and you know, maybe uh, I have to be, admit I wasn't clear on that myself, though it may have been transparent to others. Uh, seven positions, uh, eight positions. Do we need all support the motion on the floor so that we can get a briefing to understand if we look at the seven positions that the Councillor Austin is suggesting we look at, you know, what are the ones of all those positions, is there one position, two positions that's gonna give us the biggest impact for our buck, that we're ready to go? And let's talk and debate about those. And, and you're right, if we're not ready, why add positions if we're not gonna utilize them? So that's what I'm looking for, you know. Uh, and thank you, CAO, you know, it's refreshing to hear you step up and make the comments you made. 260 positions that need to be filled. There, is there some juggling that can be going on here? Uh, and I think that's fantastic, sitting down with your directors and doing that, because we have amazing directors, we have amazing staff, and I think they understand this council, the position on our, 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 our challenge and our strategy for climate change, and it is a, our priority, and in fact, one of my top priorities, so let's, let's take a look at that. You know, uh, Councilor Cleary said, it wasn't in your presentation after staff, so why are we adding your staff? Let's be clear, that direction was given, and by and someone's not here now. So my question is, what do you need, Shannon? What are the, well, let's figure out if that's one position, two positions, how do we make that happen? And yes, in the big world, how can we do it so it doesn't impact the tax rate, if we can? If not, well then we're gonna to have to have that discussion. By all means, have it. So, uh, thank you, I support the motion. Let's get it there, well, let's have this discussion in more detail when we come back, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Mancini. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Daigle-Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I also cannot support this uh, motion that's here, and it's not because we don't support climate change or the work that we need to do or anything like that, but we've heard consistently things around um, looking at this being a foundational year, getting the governance structure in place. We've heard from the CAO talking about looking at a more corporate look at what is happening. Um, I, I guess I'm afraid that asking for a briefing note is this redundant work that may come to us in another way? Will it come to us through looking at what that corporate look is around those other uh, positions? And so I just, you know, I worry about all of the briefing notes that we're bringing forward, uh, it being more work and then it being, uh, we'll have to compare this briefing note with the other briefing note because they are so interconnected, especially when we're talking about FTEs. Um, one of the things that I've seen in my career is growth faster than an organization is ready to be able to do the work that needs to be done. And sometimes what can happen with that is that the growth actually stymies the work that needs to happen. It ends up putting more barriers in place and there's more organizational work. So uh, it has a, a negative effect at, rather than a positive one if you bring in new positions before you're ready as a structure to take them in and do the work that you need to do. Um, so I wouldn't support the briefing note because I do think that this information can come to us in a different way as information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Daigle-Gammon. Go ahead, Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, Mr. Chairman. I uh, don't know if anybody had a chance to read Wayne Mason's email he sent to us from Ottawa, but uh, he's monitoring us from time to time <laughs> at the conference. Uh, just for the benefit of everybody listening, I'll read it aloud. Hi folks, I'm watching 
During a break in Ottawa, while the National Green and Sustainable Communities Conference, this is not poetic, uh, on, on staffing Halifax, the FTEs don't matter unless they do. The what matters is can the CIO confirm that the Environment and the Climate Action Team has the staff and other resources to hit the actions and goals required this year to hit our goals for 2030 and 2050? If so, fine. If not, not fine. Uh, we did not raise taxes for the environment to not then do the work to hit those targets. For me, there is zero flexibility on the timeline. We need to take steps every day, month, and year to make sure we hit our carbon goals. Again, if the budget as presented gives the CAO the resources she needs to do that, great. If in six months and a year that we find uh, we, uh, that we do not hit our goals, that would be devastating news and require strong action by council. Okay, back to the conference way. Uh, so perhaps, perhaps those questions could be answered by, by the CAO. I think that uh, I feel confident that uh, from time to time we can pivot if, if ever necessary. My question was re was going to be relating to the EV charger program. You know, I uh, understand we have federal funding coming down the pipe for that. But the question is, do we have the personnel in place to help put the EV chargers in place, especially in rural Halifax, where they're desperately needed? Because you can plug almost anywhere in urban Halifax, but when you get beyond suburban Halifax, you got to find these places where you can charge for these cars to get to and from. So, as my, as my concern was, do we have the staff available for the EV charger program? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor, I would say that yes, we do have the personnel in place for our EV strategy uh, with our manager of community energy and then we have a dedicated uh, engineer who is focused strictly on all things EV strategy implementation uh, on my team and then there's also a corporate fleet um, that has a green fleet analyst um, dedicated to kind of the purchases of our own fleet. But in terms of public and public charging infrastructure, it's well in hand and we wouldn't be the ones actually uh, putting those chargers in place physically, we'd be managing those contracts. Okay. And to answer Councillor May away Mason's question via Councillor Hensby, am I, I confident? We do. Uh, am I confident that we have the right staffing to deliver this year's goals? No, because as um, Shannon commented earlier, for example, there's $10 million of capital from last year that is not yet out the door on uh, that's coming from the Halifax program. So in addition to delivering this year's goals, we're already behind because of last year's goals. That being said, I think we need to look at, you know, staff put forward what they needed for this year in the budget. I understand, uh, you know, as part of the budget development with the previous CAO, there was some direction given uh, to business units to find reductions. I want to have the opportunity to circle around and do a next level conversation with Shannon and John and Caroline to make sure that we have this group adequately staffed for next year. But I want to do that in the context of the overall corporate staffing discussion. So I do not have confidence that they're correctly staffed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On that, on that note, I'll be supporting the motions on the floor. Thank you very much, Councillor Hensby. Go ahead, Councillor Morse. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm also going to support this motion. I think the information will help us uh, determine priorities for work in the next year. Um, I, I, uh, I think there are gaps. Um, I think I don't agree that we should fund necessarily all eight positions, seven, eight positions, but I think it would be helpful to know more about what can be done this year, what are the priorities and what are council's priorities. And the motion I brought forward yesterday was about a gap that I think has existed for a few years, has never been funded before. And if we had a green network uh, coordinator, they could um, work across every department in the, in the municipality. I think um, they would be able to um, promote the nature-based solutions that the mayor was talking about. And the, the team has proven that they can leverage funds from many different sources. And there are a lot more funds available now for um, nature-based solutions than there were even a year or two ago. So for those reasons, I'll be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Morse. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Othit. Thank you, Chair. And, and I think, I, I think 
this motion is sort of in the right spirits, but it needs, and, and you're, I think you're coming back, hopefully you're coming back, Sam, and you look at this, like for example, I can't support this so that it says specifically seven, and it can't say that it's going directly to the, the, the bow. I, and I think Councillor Mason touched on this well. What I'd like to hear is exactly what the CAO is, is talking about bringing back in general. But if you want a specific briefing note on how many people do we need and how soon and how do we fund them, if you massage this, this amendment a little bit to that, when you come back, you can frame the amendment your own amendment. But don't say specifically seven. Don't say specifically that goes to the, but just say we want a briefing note on the staffing of this department that I hope we would all be able to support that. I think right now saying that it goes to the bow that there's actually seven mentioned there, you may be a little bit ahead of yourself. But if you, if you thought about moderating this a little, I'd certainly be happy to support it in the spirit of receiving for this department in, a, in particular, if you will, in addition to what the CAO is saying she wants to do in general. So if that's helpful, Sam, but yeah, okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Othit. Uh, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Well, I, I guess that's, that's an interesting suggestion, Councillor Othit. I mean, I guess it's kind of one of philosophy. I mean, I, I don't sweat the, sweat the bowel list myself because all, it, nothing on the ballot is final till we decide. I mean, for me, um, could I vote right now to add seven people? No, I don't know what they're there for, right? So, I mean, if it makes council happy that instead of adding it to the ballot list, it becomes a briefing note request on this, I'd be okay with that because uh, when we get the briefing note back, uh, if I don't like it, I can then try my luck again to move people then. If that's if that makes people more comfortable, I'm okay doing that. Well, seven, so, you know, and I guess just to review, um, if you recall when we passed Halifax, um, the amendment that I put forward at that time, because the big concern was that it was a plan that would not be properly resourced, go on a shelf, be a bunch of pretty bold wards that then amount to nothing. That was the big concern when we passed it. And so council amended the motion to ask for a resource plan. And then a couple of months later, I think it was six months we passed it, I think it was in the summer, um, budget time comes around and um, staff, just wa it just wasn't enough time to operationalize it. And so we, we had no resource plan. And it was only by continuing to pressure for that um, that we actually got one. And then we're on year two of that resource plan. And on year two, rather than telling council um, outright, like, here's, here's, here's where we are, it's left to ask questions in a presentation where there's one line that turned out to be a cut for another area entirely to actually get a little bit of the info in which our, our new CAO you know, besides saying I'm not confident that we need the positions, but she also just said she's not confident that there is enough people there to actually do what we're required to do either. Like people, this is the most pressing, urgent emergency of our time. It is. And doing this the same old way, like, well, let's, you know, there's always next year. Shannon, as a question, that carbon budget that you have, that's not going to 2030, right? Like that, if we do, if nothing else, how quickly to the awful graph piece our box is down in the bottom corner at the current rate we're going? Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor, that's about 2027, the end 2027. of 2027. Yeah. So four years. We don't have just kind of one more year to dawdle on this issue. We don't. It's around the corner in government times and what we're being asked to do is absolutely like, you know, almost World War II-esque transformation of society. And it's not going to be just here, it has to be across, outside of these walls, in the provincial government, federal government, our big institutions, our corporations, our res all hands on deck moment. And right now, to, I'm not confident we actually have a good solid plan right now based on what I'm seeing. So um, with all that said, uh, I will, with the, if the seconder's okay, I will withdraw the motion and we can convert it into a briefing note request for staffing positions on Halifax according to the resource plan, if that is amendable to council. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor, uh, sorry, Deputy Mayor and Councillor Lovelace. That motion has, I'm not sure procedurally how we can do this. And, and so I would look for some advice. You can withdraw it, but you didn't just say withdraw, you said withdraw and convert it to. 
it was okay just yeah, to eliminate uh, the first that, piece. So, so you are withdrawing that first, uh, you were, are withdrawing the motion that's Instead on the floor? Instead of moving it to the bow, just do the briefing note request and let's get some info on these seven positions. But not going to the bow. Okay, so we would At be able time. to... Do you want to speak to this? Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the committee, I guess the question becomes, is this a larger policy discussion for regional council or is this really a, a budget piece? If it is, then it's going to the, you know, that's the time to have that discussion in the ballot. Otherwise, if it's a larger piece and recognizing that, you know, if you're looking at spending money out of that fund, it can be done at any time in the year. Um, where where do you want to have this discussion? And does it fundamentally make a difference? I'm not sure. So where we are is count, uh, the Deputy Mayor and uh, Councillor Lovelace have, have chosen to withdraw the motion. Um, if you would like to bring forth a new motion simply requesting the, the, uh, the briefing note, then that's another way to do it. But at this point, we're gonna go back to the main motion because this motion would have been withdrawn. So with that main motion, we should have the list up on the screen. And that's getting nice and populated now. Uh, let's go to Councillor Daigle Gammon first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Wasn't quite ready to get there, but uh, uh, excellent conversations. Um, one of the questions I had, uh, John, for uh, why do we need a real estate position when we have a real estate division? Could you tell me that in one of the new positions? Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor, the uh, additional real estate position is to address um, increased requirements on, on our real estate group in terms of, uh, I believe there's one for IMP related and there's one for industrial parks related work. And that's not accommodated within the division as it exists now? Uh, that's correct. It's uh, an increase. So we did have a report from the Auditor General around real estate. Was that considered when the request for the new position was put in? There were implications from the AG, uh, Auditor AG report, so. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the Councillor. Um, I would have to go back and double check that. Okay. Um, don't have that information available right now. Okay, thank you. If you could provide that, that would be great after. Thank you very much, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's see, regroup. Where were we before this conversation? Um, uh, John, do we still have an idling program? Remember there was an idling program that we had in place and uh, for, our, for our fleet of vehicles. Does that still exist? Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor. Yes, we do have an idling program and uh, there's work being done by Corporate Fleet to uh, do some promotional work across the business units and also um, some recording of impacts of idling that we can capture at a high level through our AVL. And that's something we'll be shared with us when, is it, when you have that data? Uh, it certainly can be, yeah. yes. Uh, can you talk about the uh, electric vehicle strategy? Uh, you mentioned about you're disappointed that uh, we, we're having to purchase uh, hybrid vehicles rather than fully electrical. Could you just speak to that and help us understand that? I know for the average uh, consumer out there, it's a two or three year wait to buy a new electric vehicle. Is it the same scenario we have? And what impact, if that's the case, what, what impact does that have on our strategy for our, our electric vehicle program for our fleet? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor. Um, um, I'll rely on Trevor Harvey to come up if, uh, if I don't capture this correctly, but we're seeing uh, a lot of the same issues. Um, 
that others are saying around being able to source electric vehicles. Uh, our, our plan is to work with procurement and see if there's some, some other ways that we can leverage um, some aspects that we have across uh, governmental uh, lines to see if uh, we can improve that situation. But um, as of now, it's, uh, as you say, it's a, it's a, long, uh, a long wait. Uh, what it does to the strategy is it's we it's going to set back our timeline mm. for for purchasing these. But once they are available, then we will be geared up and ready to capitalize. I on guess those. the challenge is if we're investing into hybrid vehicles. Does that really does that set us back when we finally are ready to to receive electric vehicles quickly? Mm -hmm. uh, there's still predominantly gas-powered vehicles in our fleet, so those would. There's still a lot of turnover to be done. I, I think the relative numbers are wouldn't wouldn't tip that scale. Okay, thank you. And switching gears a little bit, over the weekend we had uh, you know uh, record coal spell, especially this winter. Uh, I know of, and I mean there may be others. Uh, uh, three of our libraries had pipes burst, uh, and uh, and in Darkworth North, which is a newly renovated uh, library, it was devastating to see the damage in there. Uh, I'm surprised this happens. I don't I know. I think the mayor and I were chatting at lunchtime about this. Do we not have a, a, a proactive approach when we know we have strong weather coming coming in? Do we not you know, uh, check our buildings? Do we, you know, whether it's a, a hurricane or whether it's a big snowstorm. In this case, uh, we knew that we we're going to you know, be uh, uh, these frigid weather uh, conditions. Uh, is there not a strategy? Because now we're in a situation where I assume, assume all these. Uh, water damage is all insurance-based scenarios that's so costly to us. So is there not a strategy involved when we have these weather events and we know they're coming, are being forecasted? Yeah, our operations group is not unfamiliar with cold weather. Um, this snap was exceptional. So we're looking into each one of those instances and we're going to collect, uh, collect the data around there to understand uh, what could have been done. To uh, to avoid those those types of yeah, things. I'd like to hear about that. I, mean, I know my time is up. I'd like to hear about that because, uh, again, uh, you know, personally, I'm looking at Harper North, 2.5 million dollars, brand new, and I'm going, oh my goodness, it's terrible. Now the doors are shut, and our library is doing good stuff. So anyhow, thank you, and thank you to staff too. I'm not slamming on staff on that. I'm just concerned. How do we prevent or reduce this from next time? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Go ahead, Councillor Othit. Uh, thank you, Chair, and. Uh, just to follow up just quickly on what Councillor Mancini just said, some of these libraries are also warming centers. And for example, in Sackville, so we have a frozen pipe at a warming center, so it's close and not open for warming. Just, yeah, I think little, there's a little bit of irony there that we need to uh, prevent from happening again, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, okay, so last time I spoke, I, I had a bunch of questions for, for Shannon and I'm I also, Looking forward to what Sam brings forward at some point again to get a little bit more information on staffing for this department. My questions right now, John, are for you, and um, and I talked to Philip about this quickly, and and uh, and Diane, and they've been been fabulous. So we have the LeBrun Center, which we now know is very busy, and we've heard earlier today that the Gray is very busy, not its original purpose, uh, but we have roofs in those facilities, I think, that are need work of. Certainly there's uh, the LeBron Center roof is, is leaking, and the uh, there's problems with the scoreboard and the clock, which I have offered to be uh, part of the uh, solution to that problem. So John, one of my comments to you is going to be, where are we in the uh, plan for LeBron Center uh, roof? Because it's been sort of duct tape and chewing gum for a little while now. And uh, we want, this is used now for very much for ringette and for uh, skating and figure skating, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the fire, you mentioned on your report there, station, fire station two. Is that a second fire station or is that actually fire station number two? Because as you may know, <laughs> uh, there's a number of us around this table very concerned about the lack of fire station in West Bedford. And I, there is a briefing note uh, coming back, whether that can be, and I think Trish touched on this this morning, whether we can split that into uh, scalable or not. Uh, this, we do the fire station now, we do the training in HQ uh, over a number of times. So I'd like you the latest update on that. And then where I really get confused is for 15 years now around the table, and I'm going to touch on this on Friday, I've been talking about a library for Bedford has been promised since the amalgamation. We took a back seat with reason and with my support to Woodlawn, to North End, to North Dartmouth, 
to uh, the, the central library. And uh, now we have to see about what we can do about getting a library in Bedford. The opportunity is that the space is being designed, if you will, the exterior of the space is being designed as far as the uh, part of the Mill Cove uh, ferry project. So I'd like to understand where does this land, because I tend to get a little bit of a different answer everybody I talk with, to making sure that if we do a ferry terminal in Mill Cove, that the building that's there, <laughs> the shell that's there has an interior that could becomes a library. Is that you, is that transit, is that library? Who's, where do we get a capital budget to say we're not going to build a shell, we're going to build something inside the shell as well. If that falls through, that we don't do the, the ferry terminal, then so be it, we'll have to come up to another, with another plan. But I, I, I just have to make sure, John, what, where's the planning and the budget going into this? So I've got library, Lebrun, and fire station. Nothing big. Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor. So I'll start with the fire station. You asked about fire station yeah. two. That's station number two, which okay. is University Avenue, and that's okay. a renovation right. uh, for, uh, for yep. accommodations. Yep, which I understand, yep. Um, you asked about the West Bedford and scalability. Uh, so the current plan for the headquarters fire station is a very integrated yeah. complex. Um, when we return back with the briefing note, on that will highlight uh, the challenges of separating them and uh, likely the, the most uh, likely outcome is that we could possibly sequence construction yeah. so that the fire station part opened first and yes. then switch gears but yep. um, that might save a, a couple of months, a few months. Okay. In terms of the library in Mill Cove, uh, per the last or one of the last budget committee meetings the action was a staff report on how to fund that. So we'll be coming back with that staff report and uh, it will identify what funds need to occur in what year to, uh, to line up with the Mill Cove build. Well, where does that actually land? Is that a library project, a transit project, a year project? Who is the chief executive, the executive director, so to speak, or CEO that's gonna lead that project? Right. Uh, so the library, library sub-sheets fall under OSA, mm -hmm. uh, but our group, Property, Fleet, and Environment, is responsible for executing on those, uh, on and that capital. So we'll be okay. doing the design and the, All right. uh, you know, meshing in with the Mill Cove construction. Right. The last question was the roof for the Brun, uh, Brun and the clock, and I think that's why Philip came up, so okay. thank you. Good afternoon. Philip DeGanzik, Director of Facility Design and Construction. Through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. With respect to Lebrun, yes, we're aware <clears throat> that we've got a problematic roof there, that there are active leaks, and we understand that there's also an issue with the clock. So in order to assess and understand the uh, condition of the roof, we're having an assessment done to see mm -hmm. what repairs we can undertake and whether or not we can fund those in the current fiscal, okay. or the upcoming fiscal. Okay. Uh, the clock, I think we can accommodate also but uh, as far as the roof, if it comes back and, <clears throat> and the report indicates that we need to do a complete uh, replacement of that roof, then that's not in the, the uh, planned budget for the year. Right. So we'll have to deal with that if that's the case, but our plan is to undertake repairs to that roof. Right. Thank you, I just wanted to have that on the record and, uh, and thank you all, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Councillor Othit. Uh, just a reminder for everybody, we passed the capital budget at Council yesterday. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, it's always interesting. We get to learn so much at these uh, these budget meetings. Um, question about the solar the solar city program. I see that there's been a you know a declining number of people participating in the program. You know, um, you know, number of factors could be contributing to that. I'm wondering if you have any more insight into why you see that number's going down. And when we were here last year, we talked about um, looking at other ways of having a solar program that was more equitable, that could be available to not just homeowners with a roof facing in the right direction and the right sunlight, you know? Um, that, you know, the, that this was very specific in terms of, of who could apply and benefit and you know there was discussion about 
solar gardens, solar parks, setting aside land, putting it on tops of roofs of buildings, other ways in which we could continue to support and grow um, the solar capacity in the city, but also making it more widely available and accessible to people um, to participate and support that. Um, I'm just wondering if there's an update on that. And, and just one more comment about Lake Watchers. And this is, you know, this comes down again to like the whole staffing question, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're going to be getting a, hopefully going to get this briefing note um, on, on staffing um, for Halifax. But, you know, for, with Lake Watchers, we have, we have three staff, I think you said we have three people, two people and a consultant hiring a consultant to do that work, as well as engaging community, 15 community groups to do water testing. And I mean, this is a great program, and I was so glad to see it got approved and that we're resourcing it. Um, you know, we have so many lakes in our municipality, and with the amount of growth and development that's happening, the, the quality of those lakes is getting impacted. So I mean, I think it's an important program, but I'd also be interested in how we work with our community's partners and stakeholders more on this, about whether we can work with, like, groups like the Ecology Action Center, the Sappho Rivers Association, people who um, already are networked and have some experience um, with the water quality testing to, to help support this um, and engage people you know, in, in the activities because that fits with the educational part as well. But I'm just wondering if you could speak to how we're engaging volunteers and, and stakeholders in that, in that important work. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. Okay, so Solar City, I'm excited you asked this question because I always like talking about Solar City. Um, the reason is actually a good news story why we're, because we are the bank, we are the loaners of the money for all of those solar panel installations on homeowners um, as well as places of worship and nonprofit buildings. Um, but there's a lot more options for financing now that there, that didn't exist when we first struck Solar City. So people can independently finance the systems, they can go through other lending organizations, they can go through their banks, um, and so there are more ways for them to make a decision that works for them for solar, which is why we also had that other stat around like the total amount of solar happening in our city is actually still growing. It's just a smaller piece of the pie is Solar City. Um, and you know, we, we came to council and got approval to uh, test out some ideas for this new program we're developing, which we're calling R3 right now, the retrofit program, which still has solar as part of it um, to make it universal and more accessible. And so council approved us to use the same mechanism and still loan money to interested homeowners to test out some different concepts and ideas to try and come up with a really robust program. And that's what we're launching right now with two pilot programs. And the evaluation framework that I mentioned before that a consultant is doing for us is to look at Solar City, look at the gaps, because we know they're there in terms of accessibility and equity, and, and give us some ideas and options for how we can strike this program going forward. It's going to involve third party financing, and the study from Dunsky is really exciting. We're just finalizing it now. Um, and that opens up doors where we may have some charter limitations. Um, and the piece that is that we're waiting on from the province is around that shared or shared solar, community shared solar, uh, that we'd really like to be able to move on, but their legislation isn't finished yet. And they've had a lot of competing priorities um, at, at the province right now around energy and electricity. And so it's still on their list of to-dos and um, we're hoping that it comes soon. We did a feasibility study on the idea of putting a solar farm on the old landfill. Uh, but we want that to be using like a, a, a solar garden type of approach so that people who wouldn't traditionally have access to choosing solar could do so. That's the idea of that shared solar model. Um, so we're still very much, you know, we have our eye on that and we're waiting for that to happen. And we're finalizing that report right now too. Um, in, oh, and another thing on solar, uh, in terms of community, um, through the climate action challenges that we're running, where we're giving small grants through the partnership um, to communities with, with ideas around climate, Hope Bloom's actually put some solar awnings in their garden to charge these um, tables and benches in, in the garden and to take some um, 
some have a piece in the game of green energy and to to teach all of the people at Hope Blooms about it and it's really exciting and there's a video on that um, that we've put out so um, those are a couple of the things and, and in terms of uh, Lake Watchers um, that's how we even got the first 15 community groups interested was through networking with all of the players in the space. It's lucky for us that the Lake Watchers coordinator, who's now our manager of environment on my team, Emma Wadi, was the director and uh, um, creator of the Atlantic Water Network. So her bread and butter was being connected with community volunteer groups and nonprofits in the water space. Um, and we did some outreach, uh, she held meetings, did virtual meetings, a lot of um, kind of 101 about what the program was gonna be. And with, with the early adopters, met with them and trained them in the testing, supplied them with what they needed. And the idea is that more and more community groups will participate if they want to. Uh, you know, there's friends of this lake, friends of that lake, that type of thing. And um, we have the consulting dollars year over year in place to run that program. Um, to offset the testing. The idea with hiring the junior position that was approved when the program was approved was that we could maybe even internalize that testing and stop using a consultant over time depending on how much community participation that we had. Great, thank you very much. That's something I'd love to uh, be able to promote more, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Go ahead, uh, Deputy Mayor. Oh, I thought, uh, sorry, I thought Councillor uh, Deagle Gammon was up. I think she's only been once. That's actually me. I'm going to wait till uh, we get oh, through okay. uh, you and the mayor and Councillor Lovelace before I step down. Okay. Uh, well, I'll take a second run at this. Uh, I move that the Budget Committee direct the Chief Administrative Officer to prepare a briefing note on the positions originally planned as part of the Halifax Resource Plan for 2023-2024, including the role of each position, their potential impact on Halifax, and budgetary implications. Seconded by Councillor Lovelace. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Austin. Well, I won't belabor it. This is just uh, what I was originally hoping for in terms of a briefing note, minus um, anything going to the ballot this time. We get the briefing note back, and if there's something worthy of moving to the ballot, we move it then. Question. The question has been called. There are no speakers on the list. Ian, uh, we have Councillor Mancini. Go ahead, Councillor Mancini. I just want to make sure, though, when this comes back, Shannon, uh, if uh, positions are identified, uh, will, will we understand from this briefing note uh, if a position is put into place, the impact of that position? Well, you know, if there's, and we know, I know we're trying to stay away from the seven, the number seven, but the number seven was discussed before. Are those seven positions, uh, are we going to be clear on if you were to pick? Position one or position two, we understand the positive impact of having those in place, how it would advance what we're trying to do. Mr. Chair, through to the councillor, I think we can give a robust explanation of the jobs, and I think maybe there was a prioritization requested as well, just for clarity. Yeah, we can, we can do both of those things um, in a fulsome way for you. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, um, Call for the question also, unless so, uh, Mayor Savage is on the list. Mayor Savage is there. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. I'm not going to change the motion. I will support the motion, but when it comes back, I also want to know how likely it is we could staff it in 23 24 uh, as well. But we can discuss that when it comes back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, over to you, Ian. And that motion passes. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you are next on the speaker's list. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to... just occurs to me, I'm hearing things that I don't think are correct. Like when we're saying if we don't staff these positions, we're doing things the same old way. Um, we, well, I often hear, oh, we're not doing this right. You know, when I became mayor 10 years ago, we didn't have a Department of Diversity and Inclusion. We had one person in Anzio. We didn't have a Department of Environment. We might have had Shannon on her office side of her desk. We didn't have a public safety office. The public safety officer was in the police department. 
We certainly didn't have anybody working on homelessness. My point is we've done a lot. And a lot of that is recent, but previous councils, including some who'd been around for a long time, and it's easy to look at them and say, oh, they did these things the same old way. They took a lot of chances too. Richard Zarowski was the guy that uh, pushed us to declare the climate emergency, second in Canada to do it. Um, what's that? Things like harbour cleanup was, I, it was a huge initiative, a major cost. And if you look at our, our debt, it went up around the time of the harbour cleanup. That was a good thing to do, right? Um, my point is like, the same old way, we've gone from one or two people in the environment to six or seven to now 16. Up until last year, we had never raised taxes in my time by tax rate, I mean tax burden, because the tax rate's usually gone down. But we've never raised the tax burden by 3%. We put a 3% climate action tax. What do you want to call it, Sean? Climate, uh, we don't want the cat. Maybe we'll call it the blue nose or something like that. Another provincial oh, Lord, uh, thing. No. <laughs> we should call it the climate action tax tax, uh, the CATT. Like, we've done a lot. We should do a lot. But let's not say, let's not beat ourselves up and say, like, you know, holy cow, when I look at what this council has done in terms of diversity and inclusion, environment, supporting people who are unhoused. Many of these areas, people would say, well, that's not what the city should do. The city should do what the people in the city needed to do. And that's what we do in this council. I'm proud of it. I just don't want to see us beat ourselves up, say we haven't done anything if, if we don't hire a bunch more people in different departments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Lovelace, and then me. Uh, thank you so much. Um, just don't know what to say to that, Mr. Mayor. Um, other than uh, I think what's happened over the last few years is, is an acceleration of crises. And so in recognition of uh, certainly what past councils have done, um, I think the, the issue for us moving forward is to make changes that, that have never been done before, that have um, clear impact for safety, security, and well-being of our communities. You know, certainly we're we're doing more as a, as a municipality than ever before, but my goodness, we've got a lot more that we have to do. And we have to go faster because of the crises that we're under economically, environmentally. Uh, we need to ensure that we're, we're creating um, decisions and policies and, and, uh, and infrastructure that protect uh, the well-being of this municipality and the people that are in it and the people that are coming uh, to us. So, you know, a lot of times I hear that we, we need to stay in our lane and I think that the biggest issue here is you don't know what you don't know. And uh, so getting, you know, getting this uh, briefing note, um, getting more information to ensure that we are well positioned uh, to respond to whatever might come our way, whether we have five Dorians in a row Right, we just don't know. And so, uh, you know, we gotta shore up. And uh, I think by doing, um, by, uh, by looking deep into the resources we have, and the CAO has already said, we're gonna, you know, she's, she's gonna do a deep dive to ensure that we are well positioned. Um, and I feel confident uh, in the work that our staff do. And quite frankly, we've got incredible people a lot of really good, smart people. And we want to make sure that, uh, that they are accomplishing what we need them to accomplish. But if we don't have the information, then we don't know. So anyway, all, all I'll say is um, I, I appreciate uh, the, the work that goes into uh, the protection of our communities. Um, but I, I, I need to ask a question about, um, about land and about real estate, John. And, um, I have to ask you, when it comes to um, land that was to be transferred over from the province to the county, do we have, uh, are, are we well positioned to understand what land is still to be transferred? Um, you know, there's, there's a number of, of, of lots that are still not paying taxes. And there's no property taxes because there's no AAN. So I just, I would really like to be able to resolve some of these concerns and whether or not they come over to the municipality or, 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 or maybe they don't. But if they do come over to the municipality, I think we need to, to know about that. Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor, I'm going to call on Mike Weil for that level of detail.
How you doing, Mike? I know you've heard me ask this question before. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Mike Weil, Acting Director of Corporate Real Estate. Uh, in, in terms of the properties, I mean, since amalgamation, uh, there's new properties being discovered all the time that may not have the correct ownership between the county and the province and, and HRM now. Um, lots of different categories. I guess there's still still streets that are owned by the province, for instance, that haven't been signed over to HRM. So I, I think across multiple departments, we're still identifying some of those properties and they're being brought forward and dealt with as they do come. Um, essentially even the same with Halifax Water there's still properties to be handed over under the transfer agreement and, and new properties are discovered all the time that fall in that category. So there's no, there's no um, complete answer on that. I guess it's, it's we deal with them as they do come along. Um, certain areas such as public works would have more comprehensive lists of, of street and road networks perhaps that are being worked on. And then um, that's in addition to any any types of property negotiations we're doing for leasing properties from the province for recreation spaces or park spaces. Yeah, so I guess this is one of those, you know, questions of what, what do we know and what don't we know? Because at the end of the day, if PVSC hasn't analyzed these lots and there's no AAN, no one's paying taxes, um, you know, the question is how much are we missing out as a municipality on that? So, uh, and, and again, I don't know the breadth of the issue. I don't know how, uh, you know, large that dollar amount would be, but certainly I, d I do think that it's something that we need to begin to look at, whether it's through community planning or whether it's through, um, you know, uh, development, uh, to, to, to really understand what, what opportunities are we missing out on uh, with these lands. So thank you, I'm out of time. Thanks, Mike. I'm gonna ask Jerry to respond to that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Councillor Loveless for your question. Um, that is an ongoing issue and certainly where we can identify those issues, we do escalate those. But <clears throat> if you recall back when PVSC was here and did their presentation, I think that question was asked, right? So there's kind of two pieces, right? Uh, PVSC assess and give an assessment account number if the property kind of like is mapped and, and you know, it exists, right? So there's there's a little bit of, um, you know, some issues with the, the land registry ar around that front as well, right? And and everybody kind of working together to, to resolve those issues. Uh, a lot of them are like uh, Mr. Wild said, very complex and go back many, many years, but uh, it's probably, you know, I can't put a, a finger on the amount of, you know, revenue, but it's it's probably not very material in terms of, um, you know, our overall tax tax revenues, but it is something that we certainly are always looking at and, and to resolve. Thank you. Thank you, I'm going to ask Councillor Daigle Gammon to take the chair for a minute. Chair Russell. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have a few questions. Um, I, was, I wasn't sure if other people would be asking them or not. First of all, Shannon, um, thank you very much for mentioning the R3 model. Um, that took me back a thousand years when it was recycle, reduce, and reuse. And my goodness, we've come a long way since then with, uh, with dealing with the environmental stuff. That's, uh, it, it's amazing. Um, John, one of the items in the presentation was you, you were saying it's a good thing that we are, we are using 150,000 more square feet of leased or renovated space, uh, slide 36 in your presentation. And first of all, I'd appreciate it if you could break it down uh, to how much more leased space we have and how much space have we renovated. Um, with what has happened with COVID, I would think we would need less office space with more and more people um, working from home occasionally and people having, I think they're called apartment desks, I'm not sure, but basically they come in and they use a desk and then they go home. And if the staffing models are done correctly, that not everybody is there the full time, you don't need as many desks, you don't need as many square feet. So I don't know why 
I, I, I don't understand how it can be a good thing that we are using more. Um, you also mentioned, uh, I think a little bit later on, that the total number of workspaces is increasing. Same question. Shannon, you mentioned Lake Watchers. What exactly does that measure? And would that help us determine if a lake is improving in health, deteriorating in health? Um, what sort of impact does it have on the, on the uh, trophic state, basically? Um, the hydrogen buses. We are redoing the Ragged Lake Transit Terminal. Has there been consideration given uh, to redoing that to accommodate hydrogen buses? Um, the only comment that I've heard related to uh, uh, taking care of hydrogen is that the ceilings need to be higher. Uh, and I can certainly understand that you would not want um, the air around the ceiling to be around anything of a spark. Uh, I'm just wondering, is, is now the right time? Have we missed, have we missed the boat on that one? Uh, will we ever be able to accommodate uh, hydrogen in Ragged Lake if, if we don't have the right building this time? Um, and there was a comment about the idling program that was for HRM vehicles. I don't know if you're the right person to answer this or not, but uh, we, all, we currently have an idling um, bylaw about um, citizens idling their private vehicles. Um, it's probably, I'll, I'll ask that uh, some other time. So I just want to clarify on the 150,000 square feet, that was to highlight the amount of uh, renovations and upfit that our corporate accommodations uh, has completed. And an example of that is the new P&D space. Um, and I think what the, what the graph was intending to show was that even though our staffing is increasing over time, our, our space is remaining at a constant level. Um, so rather than, uh, purchasing a new building necessarily or leasing new space, we're able to accommodate that growth within the footprint that we currently have. And certainly one aspect of that is taking advantage of, of flex work arrangements and having introducing things like non-dedicated workspace and um, uh, providing good collaboration space. Okay, so the the hundred and fifty, the additional hundred and fifty thousand space uh, that is leased and renovated, leased and renovated, um, that that is space that we had previously leased that we are just renovating now. Uh, what that would include is space that we we currently have or new space that was leased. Okay. I, I, back to, I don't think, just my looking at it, I'm, I'm surprised that we are leasing new space. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, through you to the Chair, <laughs> the Councillor. Uh, okay, Lake Watchers testing parameters, yes. So um, it's kind of baseline testing, uh, nutrients, um, so like trophic, to determine trophic levels. Uh, we never want to really flip to a higher trophic level. It means our lakes are eutrophying, right, with too much nutrients, and then we get the high bacteria, the high weed growth, et cetera. Um, dissolved oxygen, temperature, conductivity, chloride, all those kind of general baseline testing parameters you do in limnology. Um, salts like chlorides, I said that. Um, and then after two years, we think we'll be able to do a pretty good like report and analysis, and that's when we're gonna do um, the report card and um, kind of like what is the state of our lakes and what are our recommendations going forward um, for us and for others probably. Um, and in terms of hydrogen buses in Ragged Lake, that's probably a question for transit. What I do know is that Ragged Lake was already set to expand 
um, before the e-buses were part of the conversation, and so they made the expansion that was already, you know, had secured funding and needing to happen uh, in such a way that they could accommodate the first tranche of electric buses, because Burnside can't right now until the rebuild happens. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's on transit's radar around hydrogen at both kind of major facilities down the line. They did just issue an RFP on hydrogen buses maybe last week, I found out, some type of feasibility RFP. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe when transit's up in the hot seat, you can, you can ask that question. Uh, thank you, I was simply wondering about... Uh, <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> thank you, I, I, I was simply going to ask, since... <laughs> Since property is here, about the, about the, thank you. <laughs> Can I please have a motion to choose a new uh, deputy yeah. chair of... <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you both uh, for your presentations and for the work that you do. It's amazing. And John, I just wanted to ask you about the positions that you, you are adding this year. I was, first of all, surprised to see uh, that it seemed like uh, quite a few positions. And, and my computer's wonky. I can't pull it up. It won't let me um, look at anything, so I'm going by very bad memory here. But um, Councillor Daigle Gammon mentioned the real estate position, which I was surprised to see, and I'm just—I was just wondering. So when um, when departments were asked to go back and look at what they could scale down to try to reduce a, ta a tax rate of eight percent, I was just wondering what what would the impact be to your department if these positions were not filled this fiscal year and um uh yeah and, and and what the impact to the tax rate would be if like I'm, I'm assuming that these would be baked into the proposed budget already if they've if they're being asked in in the in the report, so if they're not filled this year, what would the impact be to the work and what would the impact be to the tax rate, I guess, on either, like, a, the bookends? Mr. Chair, through you to the councillors. So um, when I look at the increases, uh, three are from environment and climate change, which are being transferred to other business units to deliver on, on their goals. Uh, we have increases for a fleet tradesperson, which falls under OCC, so that's a result of acquiring new additional assets that we need to be able to, to maintain. Uh, a couple of real estate staff to keep up with demands in the industrial parks and IMP uh, areas. We have an accessibility auditor intern to scope out our buildings for meeting the provincial access by design. And a, we're actually reducing one of the, uh, one FTE in our facility maintenance and operations group. Uh, as well as a junior, adding a junior environmental professional for Lake Watchers and an environmental professional term. So. Um, if we do not, so the net increase is two FTEs for our business unit. Uh, if we do not proceed with those, the, the impact is going to be on delivery, delivery of uh, the IMP program, delivery on industrial parks, um, uh, being able to maintain our service standards in our fleet and our maintenance and operations group. So uh, in terms of the tax rate change, 
by not proceeding with those, I don't, I wouldn't have that offhand. We'd have to have to work that so out. So the Lake Watchers, so the environment positions would go not under Shannon's umbrella, but under your umbrella? So it wouldn't be under Halifax, it no, would be under? Uh, just to clarify that, so there's uh, three positions under environment and climate change that are that are transferred to other other business units. So a marketing advisor, a financial consultant, and an environmental professional for public works. Uh, within our ad is two staff under environment and climate change. So that's the Lake Watchers the Lake Watch okay. and the pro environmental professional term. I felt like you were lonely. <laughs> Caroline Blair Smith, DCAO Corporate Services. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit to the staffing piece because I know that can be very confusing. Um, so first of all, around the question on real estate, um, certainly the demands on the real estate team have grown exponentially throughout the year. Um, and when they came forward with their initial ask, there were several positions in there. Um, and we did quite a detailed analysis and came back with just that one position. So um, I think that was asked by someone else as well. We certainly did quite a bit of analysis around that and we'll be considering some of the recommendations and comments that were made by the AG. So that was just to add to that. But also um, on some of these, you're seeing these kind of transfer in and out positions, which can be quite confusing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes because of our centralized model, HR is a good example, finance is a good example, you know, a certain project or program gets funding and certainly those positions work for that project or program, but because of the centralized model, they are more um, aptly placed within that sort of home position. So you will see, for example, a communications position that reports up to Breton and the team for kind of specialized direction, but very much works for Halifax. So that's why you see those weird kind of transfer in and out. So maybe that's helpful. Okay, that's very helpful, and I, I'm out of time. Oh. Okay. You are able to come back. I, yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, I'm looking at uh, page 26, the options under budget, and uh, just wondering, if you can answer some questions about the uh, the item uh, reducing the janitorial and cleaning contracts uh, to the tune of one hundred thousand dollars, I'm just wondering if we were to uh, put that on to the uh, the bal, um, would that reduce or would that uh, mean uh, would that mean any layoffs first of all, and also would we still be uh, you know, be able to uh, to maintain COVID safety with the uh, reduced uh, cleaning schedule. Thank you. Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor. Uh, thank you for the question. I'll ask Diane Chisholm to come up and speak to the, uh, the cleaning questions. Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor. Um, the reduction in the cleaning is mostly contract. It's not actually staff. Okay. It's contract cleaning and it's doing an analysis of the cleaning. So maybe we can cut back four hours of day cleaning at Alderney Gate or one of the other facilities. So when we, when we looked at the cleaning, we just did a deep dive and an overview of all of it. And over the course of all the buildings, we look at, you know, maybe we can reduce a few hours here, a few hours there, <clears throat> excuse me, to make up the 100,000. Okay. So there is no staffing. Perfect, right. okay. And the, the COVID piece, it uh, will still be able to maintain a, a level of COVID safety with, uh, with that reduced cleaning? Okay. So uh, with that, uh, and uh, hopefully I'm in order, Mr. Chair, I would like to move the uh, option under budget, the reduce of, uh, reduction of janitorial and cleaning contracts for $100,000 to uh, for consideration for the 2023-2024 budget and uh, move it to the uh, balance adjustment list. Second. Uh, seconded by Councillor Lovelace, I think it was. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Blackburn. Go ahead. 
Oh, nothing, nothing further to add. I mean, it was uh, uh, an under budget suggestion from the uh, from the business unit. Uh, I'm uh, I'm not comfortable uh, moving the uh, facility equipment replacement budget. I think that would put us in uh, a bit of a, a tight position, especially with uh, the uh, the condition market conditions the way the way they are and uh, the ability to. Uh, get uh, supplies these days, so I wouldn't be comfortable with that one. Uh, I haven't spoken to uh, the uh, the councillors for uh, either the uh, LeBron or the Amera Oval, so I'm not sure how they would feel about that, uh, that item, but uh, after uh, having uh, discussions on uh, the, uh, the cleaning contracts, I'm, I'm comfortable with that uh, reduction, and uh, we think uh, it should be moved to the BAL for further discussion at a later date. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Councillor Ophit. Um, thank you, and I was going to come forward with a couple of questions about the uh, budget reduction, but I'm going to speak to the one that's just been moved right now. The 100K is sort of an overall encompassing, so the, the question I have is, and I'll use a little, a little example. I, I, I'm you know, Alderney and, and uh, City Hall, I, I might be quite supportive of that. You look at uh, the uh, DeWolf Park, and you and I have talked about that, there are now hundreds and thousands of people uh, using that in the summer, and new families uh, and Canadians having picnics there, and, whatnot, and we've actually had to add cleaning. So could we, you know, so to say we don't need to clean City Hall quite as much, fine, Alderney, fine, but our public washrooms in our parks, many of which I think are probably need to be cleaned more sometimes than they are now because of the incredible amount of use. How do we break that 100K down to say that, let's bite the bullet at City Hall, but let's keep our park washrooms clean? Mr. Chair, through you for the oh. there you go. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Thanks. Chair, through you to the councillor. Well, uh, we looked at, we're not looking at the outdoor washrooms. Oh, okay. uh, we just have a new tender going out for the outdoor washrooms, but okay. most of this is the contract cleaning and where we see um, maybe we've over-serviced in cer certain areas, such okay. as Alderney Gate. We, we have some savings there where we cut back on the hours for the day cleaner because it's not full every day. So with the flex work, okay. we're able to look at all of the facilities and say, well, right. maybe we can reduce the cleaning a few hours here. So it's, it's four hours here, six hours there, five hours here. And in some cases, it's day porter service where we can cut back a little because there's not as many people in the facility during the day. No, and I get that, but I'm, yeah. I'm seeing number, about bullet number three is reduce the hours of cleaning in the outdoor washrooms. Does that not mean our parks? That's, that wouldn't be all of the outdoor washrooms, so that would be some, when, when we look at the, yeah. the entire, we look at the entire picture, so we right. have over, like we have over 80 outdoor washrooms, okay. so we may need to increase in Wolf Park, but we could probably decrease the okay. hours in some. And we've actually looked at, okay. the outdoor washrooms are very unique where we need four or five different cleanings in some outdoor washrooms per day. Yeah. So we're trying to consolidate all and, and of listen, them. And listen, I commend and you look for, at, for looking and look, at it's, that. It's, yeah. uh, it's complex because there's two hours to clean the Penhorn yeah. washroom, and then there's two hours down the street to clean another washroom. So we're looking at the bigger picture. Okay. And, and I'm yes. glad you're doing that, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think daily cleaning at Macintosh and you know items one, two, and, and four kind of make sense to me. I'm worried that, number could we break out three? and say, I really don't think our, and you might know someday, and you obviously more in touch with this, but I'm, I'm sure Councillor Mancini will have concerns about Chuby, I do about DeWolf. Could we not save a little bit of money by, and reduce the outdoor cleaning, uh, sorry, reduce the hours of cleaning in the outdoor washrooms? Many of which I think are, in my opinion, and you know more about them than I do, really can't be reduced where the other things we could. I'm just a little worried that suddenly, you know, people go to a park, they go to a playground, and the washrooms aren't as clean as they used to be. Well, in some cases, too, it's, it's hours of operation. Okay. So we usually work with parks on the opening of the washrooms. Like yes. maybe, maybe some of them opened in June, and maybe some of them opened in May. So a lot of this also, this whole analysis that we did okay. is around when do we open the washrooms? Okay. When do we close them? Like maybe we have them open for three weeks and there's nobody there. Okay. Um, or maybe we're opening them too soon, maybe we're closing them too soon. But generally, so those are the things that we're looking but at. But generally speaking, our parks and playgrounds, our picnic areas, 
do you foresee if we pass this, and I think it's worth debating this, that we are starting, we're going to start getting calls saying the public washroom in such and such park or facility isn't as clean as it used to be? That is different than City Hall or Macintosh to me. I don't foresee any okay. issues with it, and if there is, we'll certainly deal with them. Yeah, and I know you um, will, but yeah. 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 Because, okay. All right. Because some of them are of higher use than others. Yeah. So, and we have to pay atten more attention. Okay. To those. All right. Thank you. I just had to, because you know I'm going to get that question from somebody. So, all right. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Othit. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, I can't support this if it includes uh, the gray arena. I get enough complaints now that we don't clean it enough as it is, and it's overused. It's jammed. And because of where we are with the gray arena, and it we're somewhat in limbo, and I mean that respect, respectfully, because my motion was to take it off the surplus list, and I'm very uh, thankful of colleagues that would, to agree to do that. It is used. It is used uh, from lacrosse to uh, skateboarding to uh, roller derby uh, to pick, uh, pickleball, and I get complaints all the time that it's not cleaned as well. So uh, there's no way that we can reduce any amount of cleaning when it comes to the gray arena. My concern is also also should be park washrooms. I mean, that place is uh, well used all year round, uh, snow, winter, uh, summer, doesn't matter, and those washrooms are well used. And uh, I'm not sure about Cyril Smith Park, Councillor Austin, but you know, I think the same goes with Cyril Smith Park. So if those are included in it, uh, I can't support this motion because there's no way uh, it, it's going to be uh, a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's funny to me, um, you know, so this is $100,000. There's three asks on here for three fifty dollars that are under. hundred grand is like 2.2% of the PFM budget, and it's like 0.001% <laughs> of the HRM budget. We're going to spend 20 minutes talking about this. And I remember some counselors saying, you know, don't bring us the, the, the baby seals and the, and the puppy dogs. Bring us some whales. And we've got algae here. Like this is, you know, it's funny you talk about trophic levels. This is, I can't think of a lower level on the food chain that we're going after here for savings. And frankly, if an executive director needs counsel to just decide, hey, can I save a few thousand dollars in my department by, you know, moving some resources over here and over here, I'm not, I, like, we, we just, this is silly. Honest to God, this is friggin' silly that we're debating $100,000 in, uh, you know, outdoor washrooms, gray arena, city hall, and it's funny. We'll only clean it on council days. So councillors and staff, you can't come here on any other day than a council day to mess place up because no one's going to be here to clean it. Folks, uh, I can't support this. And let's let's debate real savings, not 0.0001% of the HRM budget. Let the cleaners stay, let them clean up, and in fact, to the point that's been made, we probably need more cleaners, especially in our public washrooms uh, and, and some of our facilities, than we have now. So, come on. Thank you. Go ahead, John. Yeah, Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor. Absolutely. Uh, we had to yeah. obviously dig deep uh, as a service provider, so we deliver service to our business unit clients, to the public, to employees, and these these demonstrate the areas where we are able to look at our budget and say we can reduce. None of them are palatable. Uh, none of them make me feel comfortable, uh, but they are presented as, as options for under budget. Thank you, John. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Go ahead, Councillor Daigle-Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so not, I, I mean, I'll, I'll support this to go to the to the file, but just to go back to the conversation, Jerry, if uh, on process, because we don't want all of this stuff coming to the bow and we debate it again and we're just duplicating our conversations and discussions. So if people wanted this to stay where it's at, they could just vote for it to stay, right? Or does it have to go to the bow in order for it to be um, With not done as a under? Yeah, good question. So if, you know, what has put, been put forward, and, and John said it well, is a, is a list, right? And a lot of business units yeah. had to dig deep. We're looking for 25 million in sustainable cuts. So, you know, no stone kind of went unturned. Right. Um, if, if you don't, if you just want to leave it in, 
Don't bring it up. Don't add it to the bow. Great. Don't even talk about it. But for this one here, you might what you'll I need to, to you defeat the motion. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon. We have no further speakers on the list. Ian, it's over to you for, uh, sorry, are we ready for the question? This is on the budget adjust, uh, adjustment list item for reducing the janitorial and cleaning service contracts of $100,000. The motion is on our screen. Again, no further speakers. Are we ready for the question? The question's been called. Ian? Thank you, that, amend, er, that, uh, that item fails. So we are back on the main motion. Councillor Outhead. Uh, thank you, and Sean will be glad I'm not bringing forward one of these little bell uh, numbers. Uh, I do have a question though. We've had, we're gonna pass this today, I would think, after a, a, a pretty good discussion, but in that includes uh, a couple of things, you know, the, the extra real estate positions, the extra. So what happens next? We pass this, it goes on to the next level, but if the CAO comes back to us and says, well, I have met with, with John and we're going to add a person here, we're not going to add this one, we're going to add one to real estate now and maybe one next year. How do we, how does this work, Jerry or Kathy or John? where we're, we still have some information to receive on NFTEs, particularly in this division, I would say, before we're really going to see what the final budget looks like. So how, how's this practically going to work? Councillor, so I guess practically, if, if we have approval yeah. um, for this, we obviously need to go through our internal approvals for hiring. So uh, we'll certainly be working close with um, the CAO to determine which which are going to go ahead and and which should be part of a um, you know a larger look. Uh, okay, I, I, that was quite my question, but my, my my depending on the discussions that you have with the CAO and, and Jerry and others, this budget could go up a few hundred thousand. It could come down a few hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. If we were hiring, or we hired seven people, we don't hire seven people. We have one real estate person, not two. So, where, when do we see, and how do we approve the final, if you will, version of this? That would be with the uh, report for the budget adjustment list, and you will see that okay. each right. week you're getting an email from Jerry with the list of um, what's been added to the budget adjustment list and giving you a sense of where the increase in tax burden currently sits. Okay. And once we get through all of the business units, what we're envisioning is um, we take that feedback. We'll come back with a recommendation based on this is what we propose is the operating budget and the budget adjustment list, and so, you'll have okay. to approve so changes not, not then. So not to split hairs though, what you said you were going to do today, which we all applauded, is not really part of a ballot list though. This is you doing your due diligence to have a look at FTEs organization-wise, so that's not really being triggered by something on the ballot list. I already have the meeting set up for us to do an FTE scrub, <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be done in time for us to incorporate in the budget okay. that comes back. Okay. And if it if there are any adjustments that okay. you know haven't been discussed and aren't okay. arising from a budget adjustment list item, okay. we'll just make that clear okay. in the covering report to council. So you'll bring back your own little bow list if I added this or took this off or whatever. It might be called the CAO wish list. Well, that's fine, but I, I just want to understand that. Thank you. I certainly support that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Outfit. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Purdy. So I, I think I understood that. So just to, um, and my computer isn't wonky, so I'm able to pull it up here. So these positions, when we vote on this budget today, we're voting in favor of these positions and then the CAO will come back in due time prior to the end of this budget season with her recommendations that could have an impact on the final budget. 
The vote today would be on the motion that was presented for the property, fleet, and environment budget, operating budget, yes. Which includes, of course, the new hires. We have not made any changes as far as adding an item to the budget adjustment list except for the briefing note that was requested. Uh, these positions uh, that have been suggested as options under budget are not going to see a change. Okay, sorry. So these full-time positions are not a part of what we are voting on right now. Yes, yes they are. That. Okay. Go ahead, CAO. So the FTE changes that were presented in Mr. McPherson's slides are encompassed in that motion. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, there is the request for the briefing note looking at FTEs and also the sufficiency of the staffing for Halifax 2050. Mm -hmm. So, and if, if we identify that, you know, we're, we're not quite comfortable with what we've got capacity for for Halifax 2050 next year, the answer of how we deal with that may not be a new FTE, it may be moving an FTE, it may be externally contracting something. So I want, want to have the opportunity to look, look at um, what the needs are and how we most cost effectively can meet it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. There are no further speakers on the list. Are we ready for the question on the main motion? Question. The question's been called. Ian? Thank you very much. That motion passes. Uh, we have finished with property, fleet, and environment for the day. Um, the next item mo is a motion to adjourn, please. From Councillor Lovelace. Thank you. We stand adjourned. <laughs>